The chapter begins with a young boy stirring awake in an alley, uttering, Hmm, this place is... That's right, I was reincarnated. Visibly shaken but flushed with excitement, he exclaims, So, it wasn't a dream, and proceeds to test the reality by pinching his cheeks. It hurts, he confirms. Curiously surveying his surroundings, the boy navigates through the alleyway and into the bustling city, keenly observing the people immersed in their daily routines. This is the world I'm living in he muses. But I was surprised. A god appeared out of nowhere, after all. The scene transitions to a humanoid winged creature earnestly apologizing to a man donned in a suit, identified as Mr. Shinomiya. Mr. Shinomiya, visibly puzzled by the creature's sincere apologies, interrupts and expresses his confusion about the unfolding events. The creature, pausing for a moment with beads of sweat forming, hesitates before revealing, well... To tell you the truth, just a while ago, Mr. Shinomiya passed away in an accident. The scene depicts a speeding truck striking him, leaving Mr. Shinomiya in shock. Suddenly, Mr. Shinomiya exclaims, Ah, I just remembered! Asterisk. So that means this is the afterlife? The winged creature affirms, Yes. That's correct. Mr. Shinomiya then inquires, Then perhaps you're a Shinigami. The creature, responding with a mix of embarrassment and fluster, vehemently denies, Th That's wrong! Absolutely wrong! While letting out a startled scream. Following that, the creature gestures towards a house in the distance and suggests, Since this will take a while, let's move over there. The scene shifts to the duo sitting at a table with cups already poured. The creature invites the man to help himself, but the man, unable to conceal his confusion, stares at the cup. The focus then turns to the creature, who discloses his identity stating, I am the chief of the heavenly realm, Samadila. Please feel free to call me Samadhi. Eh, I am. The flustered man attempts to introduce himself, only for Samadhi to interrupt, saying, You're Mr. Shinomiya, right? I am already aware. Ah, uh, I see, Shinomiya responds, while Samadhi smiles. Fast forward, and Samadhi begins elucidating the reason for summoning Shinomiya. The reason I summoned you here is to explain how you found yourself in this situation. Gods are entities that guide humans. However, a certain god shamelessly decided to abandon this duty, broke one of the heavenly realm's taboos, and toyed with Mr. Shinomiya's fate. Reflecting on Samadhi's words, Shinomiya remarks, I can already think of several incidents that hit the mark. That time when the bookshelf fell over even though I didn't touch it, the suspension bridge broke when I tried to cross it. Or that time when my parents found out they were cheating on each other and broke up afterward. Samadhi continues explaining the situation while covering his face in shame, saying, Asterisk. Since this entity was skillful in escaping our supervision and continued messing with Mr. Shinomiya's life, this accident occurred. Shinomiya responds, slightly Slightly annoyed with a simple, I see. Now kneeling, Samadhi says, These were the circumstances that forced me to summon Mr. Shinomiya's soul to heaven. However, even though I am the chief of the heavenly realm, I cannot bring you back to your original world. Shinomiya implores, I'll raise your head, please, then I can't go back to heaven anymore. About that. Suddenly, Samadhi proposes, How about reincarnating in a different world? Shinomiya, shocked and a bit confused, stares as Samadhi continues with his proposal. To redeem myself, I thought about it for a long time, and decided to investigate you, Mr. Shinomiya. You yearn for fantasy-esque worlds like those in games and anime, right? So, I am thinking of sending Mr. Shinomiya to a different world to experience a new life there. What do you think? Ecstatic with happiness, Shinomiya responds, With pleasure! Samadhi, equally delighted, replies, I knew you would accept my proposal. And then he snaps his fingers, revealing a status screen. These are my abilities, Shinomiya asks, a bit surprised. Samadhi explains, Yes, right now only your soul is here, so most of them have been lost. However, the techniques you've cultivated on Earth are left as skills and special abilities, he responds. As Shinomiya engages in an inner monologue, he takes a moment to observe and reflect on his skills. Cooking, because I don't live with my parents, I was cooking for myself he notes. The special ability, high memory capacity, maybe has something to do with my ability to memorize things so well that I could remember a whole textbook just by reading it once. Interrupting Shinomiya's thoughts, Samadhi says, please help yourself to another cup. As Shinomiya sips from the cup handed to him, he resumes his contemplation saying, according to Samadhi, you can acquire new skills through training, but the only way to attain special abilities is by having an inherent aptitude for it or receiving it from a god in the distant future. Shinomiya wonders aloud, can I keep my ability even even if I am reincarnated? Samadhi responds affirmatively, adding, and we will support you as much as possible. Shinomiya poses another question. Is it all right to bring my earth knowledge to my new world? Samadhi reassures him, saying, it's fine since there was a person reincarnated with all of his memories intact before. Besides, Mr. Shinomiya will receive a gift from all the gods as a token
token of apology. You can request up to three skills when you are reincarnated. Shinomiya then wonders, is it okay to receive such a thing? Samity reassures him, of course. And like I said, this incident was due to my incompetence, so there is no need to hold back. Even if you suddenly tell me that, could you let me think about it for a bit? Shinomiya responds, looking a bit tired from the thinking. Yes, I will wait here until you decide. For your reference, I wrote all the skills that exist in the other world on a board, Samadhi says, summoning a giant scroll. This doesn't end! Shinomiya exclaims, shocked, as he observes the scroll. He then turns around to see his friends fast asleep. I'm done! Shinomiya declares, waking up Samadhi. The scene transitions to an exposition where the chosen skills are being explained. The first skill is the appraising eye, which allows one to gain information information by assessing objects and human skills. If you possess a skill that lets you see more targets than the appraising eye and have the ability to block the appraising eye's function, you can cancel that skill. Skill number two is the useful box which addresses the limited capacity of item boxes and storage skills. Storing items over the maximum number is not allowed due to the limited capacity of item boxes. However, the useful box allows you to store items by categories rather than quantity. The maximum number of categories you can store is determined by half of your MP, with no other limitations. Yeah, yeah, don't you think it's cool? I forgot to add that, since you can upgrade your skill level, you should consider skill growth before creating them, Samity interjects. Is that so? But the idea of cultivating skill growth is kind of foreign to me, Shinomiya says. When it comes to appraising skills, increasing your level upgrades the amount of information you can process for storage. Your storage capacity will increase or something like that. You get the picture, Samadhi explains. But the useful box has unlimited capacity, so how should I improve it? Shinomiya questions. Samadhi responds, what if you make it in such a way that you can obtain different new functions each time you level up? That would be awesome. Shinomiya responds. But how will I acquire those new functions, though? What if you decide on the functions you want when you level up? Samadhi suggests. Shinomiya wonders. Is it really fine to decide on the effects later on? This is an exception. I think some necessary functions will appear. So please use them, Samadhi says happily. Shinomiya expresses gratitude to Samadhi and contemplates if the third skill could be a daily life magic skill, a skill that enables him to fly, summon fire, conjure jewelry, and even control the wind. Samadhi closes its eyes and holds its head, appearing quite distressed. After opening its eyes, Samadhi mentions that such a skill would be going overboard and might disturb the world's balance. However, it should at least have a limit. Of course, I understand, Shinomiya says, flustered. Samadhi holds its hands in a prayer position and says, since the maximum skill level is five, let's set it up so you learn five skills each time you increase your level by one. Suddenly, a lot of glow starts emitting, indicating that the spell has been finished. Announcing that all preparations are now complete, Samadhi says, this is goodbye. Shinomiya, taken aback, asks if he will ever get a chance to meet Samadhi again, showing that he has grown quite affectionate toward it. Samadhi reassures Shinomiya that if he prays every day and his faith skill keeps increasing, their reunion is a possibility, and it looks forward to that day. With this, Samadhi concludes its speech, opening a veil to the new world and wishing Shinomiya a fulfilling second life. We transition to Shinomiya, who questions, but why am I already a kid? Samadhi explains that the next time I wakes up, I will be a baby. Accepting the current predicament, Shinomiya checks his status using the appraisal command. As he navigates through his status, he realizes that there is no name, pondering if it's because he just got reincarnated. Noticing that he has been bestowed with numerous super strong skills, Shinomiya tells himself, this isn't the time to be surprised. Let's check things one by one. Examining his skills, he discovers three new ones, world language, exp amplification, and God's veil. Though surprised by these unfamiliar skills, he reassures himself there is no harm in having them. His attention is then drawn to the skill God Samadilla's protection, which entails the initial MP is increased to 100, reaching up to 1,000 at max level. The more one increases their magical ability, the closer they become to the existence of a god. After reading this, Shinomiya says, I see, but it's not just a couple of hundreds. I wonder how it works. He then peruses bruises other skills that catch his eye, such as the title Reincarnated, given to individuals who got reincarnated from a different world, with a rare acquisition of the world language special skill. Another title, The God's Host, is given to people who host the soul of a god, becoming closer to the existence of a god as they increase their magical ability. The Blessed is a title given to individuals who received the divine protection of a god, making it easier for them to raise their faith skill level. Shinomiya reads about the abandoned child, a title given to children abandoned by their families. When luck increases, the owner of this title is adopted and the title disappears. Lastly, the title, Nameless, is given to individuals expelled from their family with their name removed from the family tree. Although they can give themselves a new name, changing the family name is impossible. This title disappears when they acquire a new name. Shinomiya, feeling a bit tired, stretches and says, hmm, I was able to memorize most of the effects thanks to the 
the high memory capacity. But man, there are a lot of terms I'm unfamiliar with. Anyways, I should try out other skills. He then decides to use daily life magic and commands it to show him the types of magic he can learn at this stage. Suddenly, a strange rush of energy flows through his body, surprising him as he exclaims, Did I learn them just now? Shinomiya opens the magic attribute tab and realizes that there are a lot of elements. Excitedly, he decides to give it a go and tries to use some fire magic. After a bit of struggling, he manages to summon fire on his fingertips. So cool! I really was able to use it, Shinomiya says happily. He then opens his useful box and notices that he got a letter from Mr. Samadhi. Shinomiya proceeds to open the letter and reads its contents. I have bad news. The wicked god who was messing with Mr. Shinomiya's fate slipped past our noses and attempted to interfere with your reincarnation this time. Unfortunately, the process of reincarnating you into a baby was interrupted, making it hard to carry your memories over. Before reincarnating, it might take 10 years at most until you get your memories back. Even Mr. Shinomiya's bad luck was due to the strong interference, and he never had the chance to experience a blessed life due to his low luck. Shinomiya, annoyed and flustered, exclaims, Did I become an abandoned child? because my luck was terrible? Shinomiya continues reading the letter. By the way, I took care of that problem and made sure it won't happen again, so you don't have to worry. I gave you additional abilities as an apology, but a certain problem came up. Wondering about the hesitant tone, Shinomiya learns that in this world, when children turn 10, they undergo a ritual called the appraising ritual to identify their skills and special abilities. However, none of Mr. Shinomiya's skills showed up due to his missing memories. Consequently, his parents considered him a failure and used it as a reason to expel him from the house. Shinomiya then grasps that it wasn't bad luck, but Mr. Samadhi's fault that he got expelled initially. Well, it's not like he did that with bad intentions. I have mixed emotions, Shinomiya says, looking somewhat depressed. That's right, maybe now I can recover my memories from the last 10 years, Shinomiya realizes. I might find a clue. He closes his eyes and focuses. The scene shifts to a house in a forest, and a compilation of flashbacks unfolds. A baby sleeping in his mom's arms, a child Shinomiya near someone who's sick, a person holding flowers near a grave, Shinomiya Mia thrown in jail and a man saying, this accursed failure, our house's disgrace. You don't have either skills or special abilities. Pathetic. We fast forward to the same man facing away from Shinomiya, who now dons a fancy outfit. The man begins speaking, I don't want this, but it's tradition, so don't think I will change my mind based on the results of the appraising ritual. I have no need for an incompetent failure. Don't show your face here again. Shinomiya, expelled and ousted from his home, walks desperately wondering, what should I do now? What a catastrophe. Following the path his mother once told him, Shinomiya collapses on the ground. In this vulnerable moment, a hooded stranger approaches, lifts him up, and halts an incoming carriage. As the stranger hands him some money, Shinomiya ponders, Did that silver-haired man help me? Shinomiya checks his clothes and discovers a letter, instructing him to go to the Adventurer's Guild and hand a specific piece of paper to the receptionist with a scar on his face. The Adventurer's Guild, huh? The noble path described in the fantasies I read a lot in my previous life. Even though I'm scared of this unknown world, why do I feel this excited? Shinomiya wonders. He proceeds to ask around for the location of the Adventurer's Guild until he notices a building with a bird in its symbol. Yep, that's the one, Shinomiya confirms. He enters the Recommendee's Kingdom headquarters of the Adventurer's Guild in the capital, amazed by the numerous strong-looking individuals present. Then, he recalls the task at hand, finding someone with a scar on his face. Hmm, the reception desk is vacant over there. Let's try asking someone, Shinomiya decides. The chapter concludes with a scary-looking individual staring in Shinomiya's direction. The headquarters of the Adventurer's Guild in the capital, located in the Recommendee's kingdom. Shinomiya stares at the man matching the details from the letters he found. Wondering why no one is standing at his reception desk, Shinomiya dismisses any foul play and excitedly approaches the man. Um, excuse me? Is this also a reception desk? Shinomiya inquires. The man responds, seeming a bit shocked. That's right. Shinomiya happily replies, I'm glad. If I got it wrong, I wouldn't have any idea. The scene then shifts to people whispering behind him, saying, hey, that kid, he's got some guts, huh? The man with the scar closes his eyes, displaying a slight annoyance and asks Shinomiya, kid, aren't you scared of me? Shinomiya, slightly puzzled and pausing at the question, replies, hmm, not really. I thought you were a bit scary, that's all. Shinomiya continues, also, there's a letter I want to give you while handing over the letter. The man with the scar acknowledges, a letter? I see. That guy, huh? And then inquires, are you acquainted with him? Shinomiya asks, and the man with the scar responds, no. I'm just talking to myself. The man with the scar attempts to steer the conversation in a different direction, asking, So, do you have any other business? Shinomiya, 
taken aback, realizes he didn't plan this far ahead, and ponders what to do next. After a few moments of silence, the man with the scar suggests, you know, stuff like a request or an adventurer registry, you know? In an internal monologue, Shinomiya acknowledges that this is a fantasy world, and since he can use magic, it might be worth a try. Yes, I came here to become an adventurer, Shinomiya declares, screaming with a blush, displaying a mix of shyness and excitement. The man responds, I see, there's no particular limitation except for a test. The scene shifts to Shinomiya, who looks extremely excited and happy, radiating innocence. The man, however, ignores Shinomiya's excitement and asks, do you have money? Shinomiya, a bit taken aback, inquires, money? It costs one silver coin. Ah, I can make an exception and pay for your... Before the man finishes his words, Shinomiya, with a look of nervousness on his face, searches his bag and finds it. Is this enough? He asks, holding a coin and wondering if it's from the mysterious hooded man who saved him when he was passed out. The man with the scar shows a hint of excitement and says, yep, that leaves. Handing the boy a paper, he adds, bring that and follow me. As they make their way downstairs, the man finally introduces himself as Guldo. After his introduction, he turns to Shinomiya, asking for his name. Flustered, Shinomiya realizes he's still nameless. In the heat of the moment, he recalls the names he used for his video game characters. Laruku, I often use this name for my video game characters in my previous world. After a while, Laruku declared that he had completed answering the questions. Name, preferred weapon skills. You didn't leave anything blank, huh? Daggers, swordsmanship, and fire attribute magic, Goldo remarked as he analyzed the responses. To prove his proficiency in fire magic, Laruku summoned a fireball. Goldo, slightly surprised, commented, Looks fine to me. I'll start explaining the test he announced. It's quite simple. You need to attack that measuring dummy with both your magic and weapon, Goldo says. Laruku responds, what happens when I attack it? Goldo explains further, see the plate on its body? The amount of power you use will convert to a number and appear on the plate. I see. Understood, Laruku says. Goldo sets the parameters. The time limit is one hour and the passing mark is 300 points. Do your best, he says, officially announcing the beginning of the test. Laruku summons a fireball and fires it at the dummy to test the waters. 101? Laruku is deeply shocked and filled with despair, light tears streaming from his eyes. He reassures himself, saying, I just need to increase it threefold. Focusing all his energy, he creates a fireball as big as he can muster and shoots it at the plate. 110? Not enough at all, he mutters shocked by the result. Laruku grabs his head, but reassures himself that there is still some time. A montage follows, showing Laruku firing fireballs repeatedly at the dummy, yet the results fall far behind. Hey, are you alright? Goldo asks, looking worried at Laruku, who has passed out on the ground. Yes, Laruku responds with tears in his eyes. Suddenly, Laruku realizes that the damage he is inflicting is increasing each time. Appraisal! Laruku shouts, bringing up his ability tab. It seems his hunch was correct. He has learned a new ability called Magic Control, and his MP and Fire attribute have leveled up. Now, harboring a glimmer of hope, Laruku says, first, conjure a flame, then boost its power and accuracy with the magic control skill. Laruku forms the fireball as large as possible and releases it. 324, did I nail it? Laruku asks, looking back at Mr. Goldo with a happy expression. But then he suddenly blacks out. After a while, Laruku finally opens his eyes, questioning, where am I? You finally woke up. I heard it's a combo of magic, overuse, and malnutrition. You okay? Goldo asks, looking slightly concerned. Yeah, sorry for the trouble and the test, Laruku Laruku says with a worried look. Don't worry, you passed, Goldo reassures him. A wave of happiness sweeps across Laruku's face. Goldo scolds him, saying, but taking care of one's health is also an adventurous job. Laruku apologizes, admitting, I haven't eaten anything since coming to the capital. Goldo, with a sympathetic look, says, if you want, but a growl emanating from Laruku's stomach interrupts him. Let's get you something to eat first. You're a kid, so you should act like one, Goldo says, rubbing Laruku's hair. Get ready. Are you okay eating in the guild's cafeteria? Goldo asks. I'm sorry. I can't thank you enough for your kindness, Laruku says, expressing immense gratitude for the man's kindness. Laruku straightens his clothes and checks himself in the mirror, surprised by his different appearance. His hair has changed to silver, and so has his face. However, this change doesn't seem to bother him, as he thinks he looks quite handsome now. What's wrong? I'll leave you behind, Guldo says, surprised at the boy who's still admiring his own face. The scene switches to a delicious steak being served, and a man apologizing for the weight it took to prepare the meal. Goldo thanks the man, whose name seems to be Fritz. Fritz shows concern considerable surprise that Goldo would bring a kid and introduces himself as the manager of the Adventurer's Guild cafeteria. Laruku introduces himself, but Fritz quickly shifts the conversation, stating that he must have guts, given Goldo's expressive face, which must have given Laruku some jitters. Laruku acknowledges that might be true, but contrary to appearances, Goldo is a very nice person. Clearly annoyed, and with his embarrassment meter rising, Goldo expresses his discomfort. Fritz affirms that Goldo is probably the nicest person in the whole capital. Laruku chimes in, saying, Just as I thought, with 
With Goldo's embarrassment meter reaching its limit, he taps Fritz, indicating that it's about time he goes back to work. Yeah, yeah, Fritz says. Before he leaves, he tells Laruku to get along nicely with Goldo. With his embarrassment meter full, Goldo throws a spoon at Fritz's back out of embarrassment. Sheesh, that guy loves to joke way too much. Whatever he says, don't take it literally, Goldo advises Laruku. Yes, Laruku replies, still focused on the food. Goldo continues, that's right, there's something I want to give you. Is now a good time? Laruku swallows his food and says, yes, please, don't worry about me eating. It's this necklace, Goldo says, showing a pendant. It will work as proof of your guild membership. You could also use it as your ID card if you travel to another country. Make sure you don't lose it, Goldo emphasizes. Goldo also reveals that Laruku needs to put some blood on the metal plate. Laruku is a bit scared, but Goldo assures him that just a small drop is needed and hands him a needle. The scene switches to Goldo grabbing Laruku's finger, and in the process of pricking it, Laruku asks, scared, is it done? Goldo replies, not yet, and then pricks his own finger. Laruku's name gets engraved into the necklace's plate. Curious, Laruku asks if the plate changes its color. Color? Goldo questions, but then realizes what Laruku is getting at. He starts explaining that adventurers are ranked by a five-point grading scale system from A to E, and the colors change accordingly. Copper from E to D, silver from C to B, and gold for the strongest rank. A. Laruku reflects, I see. My silver-haired lifesaver had a silver plate, right? That means he was an adventurer. Since it's already late, go and spend the rest of the night at the doctor's office. That way, I won't have to worry about something happening to you, Guldo instructs. Thank you very much, Laruku responds, showing his gratitude. The next morning, Laruku ponders, Guldo told me to go to the guild master's room. Is this the right place? Guldo's expression was quite intimidating. So what if the guild master's face is even scarier? Laruku knocks on the door, then opens it. I've been waiting for you, Guldo says. Laruku replies, Good morning, Mr. Mr. Goldo. He's actually talking to Goldo. That's a real surprise, right, Lala? The apparent master exclaims. The girl, who appears to be an assistant, promptly scolds her, saying it's rude, and greeting the child should come first. I am the deputy master, Lala Tina, and this person is the guild master, Lefia. Please call me Fia and her Lala, okay? Interjects the guild master. Please, make yourself comfortable at any available seat, the guild master warmly invites, gesturing towards the array of chairs. Lala, could you kindly bring us some tea? I'm about to brew it, Lala responds, moving towards the tea set. As the aroma of fresh brewed tea wafts through the room, the guildmaster notices Laruku tightly clinging to Goldo. With excitement, she exclaims, Lala, look, he's clinging to him. He's really clinging to him. Jeez, stop overreacting, Lala says, slightly annoyed at the guildmaster's enthusiasm. Resuming a more composed demeanor, the guildmaster turns her attention to Laruku and asks, when you were registered as an adventurer, something peculiar caught our attention, the guildmaster continues, her eyes narrowing slightly. Laruku, do you have a family? She asks, anticipating his response. Laruku hesitates for a moment before before replying, well, I was expelled from my house recently, so I'm alone now. Right on the money, huh? Goldo interjects with a stern yet sympathetic expression. The guildmaster, her tone softening, adds, you can choose not to answer if it hurts, but I'm curious, why were you expelled? She looks at Laruku, her eyes betraying a hint of sadness. I was deemed a failure because my skills didn't manifest during the appraising ritual, but yesterday you used magic, Goldo remarks, looking somewhat flustered. Laruku responds, his expression serious. I believe that happened due to my special ability. Special? ability? Everyone echoes in shock. I possess a unique ability that nullifies any type of appraising magic, and because of that, my skills didn't appear, Laruku explains, revealing the mystery behind his lack of visible abilities. Lala, still uncertain, looks at Laruku and asks for permission. May I use appraising magic to see for myself? Laruku nods, giving his consent. Lala then performs the appraising spell, her eyes narrowing in concentration. After a moment, she looks up with a disappointed expression, confirming, indeed, nothing appears at all. The guildmaster, now thoroughly Thoroughly intrigued, remarks, Even Lala can't see it. Isn't that amazing? She marvels at the uniqueness of Laruku's special ability, recognizing the extraordinary nature of his skills that remain hidden from conventional appraisal. Laruku then says, Thank you. Is that everything you want from me? Yes, we only wanted to check your background, the guildmaster responds. Then, Goldo, make sure to bring him down there, okay? I know. Let's go, Goldo says. And as they prepare to leave, the guildmaster adds, Let's play again soon, bidding Laruku farewell. Goldo and Laruku make their way to their destination, and Laruku, Curious asks, where are we going? You'll see soon enough, Goldo replies mysteriously. All right, it's here, Goldo announces as they reach their destination, and Laruku inquires if it's a warehouse. As they enter, Laruku is greeted by the sight of a vast storage area. You see, a great number of adventurers return with materials they acquired from their quests. For your first quest, you need to store these materials, Goldo explains to Laruku. I gladly do it, Laruku says excitedly, sensing the adventure that lies ahead. That helps a lot. After all, this amount is way beyond what I can handle by myself. With the 
revelation of the giant storage facility, Laruku is faced with the vastness of materials accumulated by countless adventurers, marking the beginning of his journey into the world of quests and challenges. In the world of adventures, triumphs are celebrated when daring individuals or groups successfully fulfill requests. Guilds are powerful institutions dedicated to aiding adventurers offer an array of resources and amenities. Upon joining a guild, members unlock a myriad of benefits. Mr. Goldo enlightened me last night, sharing that as I undertook my initial quest, my focus remained unwavering amidst the excitement and anticipation. Guild membership truly proved to be a gateway to invaluable support and countless opportunities. The scene seamlessly transitions back. Having you here truly saved me, Laruku. Gold expresses his gratitude, while Laruku fixates on a peculiar doll. Taking in the surroundings, Laruku observes the overwhelming array of gear and materials. Considering the sheer magnitude of this task, it's impossible for just one person, and even two might find it challenging, he remarks, determination in his eyes. I'll give it my best shot, though, Laruku assures. That's the spirit, Gold responds with encouragement. As time elapses, Laruku diligently attempts to organize the clutter, only to realize that progress is minimal. Gold reflects, it seems this is quite a formidable challenge, even for the two of us, huh? At this rate, it seems like it'll never end, Laruku exclaims, visibly flustered. However, a sudden realization dawns upon him, prompting him to suggest, maybe the useful box could help. Laruku proceeds to store various items in his useful box and confirms, yes, just as I thought, I see now. I fully understand this ability. He goes on to explain the functionality of the useful box, stating, with the useful box, it's possible to move items in and out within a five meter range. Stored items are automatically arranged and remain organized even after being taken out. If I repeat this process, Goldo interrupts, checking on the young boy, questioning the progress, only to be amazed as Laruku confidently says, Mr. Goldo, I'm almost done. Goldo, with immense happiness, observes the tidied up space, wondering where Laruku moved the huge pile of items. Laruku calmly reveals, I possess a storage type skill, so I used it. Acknowledging Laruku's rare skill, Goldo remarks, yet another rare skill, huh? However, he quickly decides, ah, no time to dwell on that. It's better to finish as quickly as possible. Goldo expresses gratitude saying, thanks a bunch, while affectionately rubbing Laruku's hair. All right, let's go to the next room, he suggests. Laruku responds with excitement, saying, yes, only to realize, what, another room? He discovers there are three more rooms to tackle, prompting laughter from Guldo. Sometime later, Guldo is gently rubbing Laruku's hair, who appears visibly exhausted. Guldo expresses his gratitude, acknowledging that Laruku truly saved him. Guldo reassures Laruku, promising to inform the guildmaster that the task is completed. Yes, I still feel tired even though I used my skill, Laruku admits. Still contemplating the scenario, he wonders aloud, I can't help but wonder what would have happened without my skills, picturing the potential mess that would still be present. Suddenly, the sound of approaching footsteps echoes, and to Laruku's surprise, it's none other than the headmaster, Miss Fia. Miss Fia! Laruku exclaims, turning around in shock. Guldo told me, can you store this silver coin using your skills? The headmaster eagerly asks, her eyes shining with excitement. Laruku decides to give it a try and effortlessly stores the coin. Amazed by his ability, the headmaster exclaims, Without even touching it, you were able to store it! She embraces him so tightly that he struggles to breathe. Goldo intervenes, pulling Laruku away with one hand and using the other to gently hold the headmaster back, urging her to calm down. The headmaster admits she can't help her excitement, explaining she has never seen such a skill before. Don't you agree, Lala? She asks seeking validation. Lala agrees, saying, well, you're right. The headmaster then turns back to Laruku, requesting him to demonstrate another ability. However, Lala intervenes abruptly, striking the headmaster to the back of her neck, rendering her unconscious. Apologizing on her behalf, Lala suggests that Laruku and Guldo should probably leave for the day. Guldo and Laruku stroll into town, with Guldo explaining that the headmaster is usually quite docile but she loses control whenever she encounters a rare skill or magic item. Ha ha, looks like it, Laruku remarks. Guldo then suggests, are you free now? I'm thinking of showing you around the capital. Laruku, a bit taken aback, quickly responds, is it all right? I'd love to. 
Goldo takes Laruku on a tour, exploring various stands and even treating him to some food. Afterward, Goldo decides to buy Laruku some clothes. As they reach the payment counter, a slight argument ensues. Laruku, not wanting to impose on Goldo, insists on paying for his own clothes. After a brief back and forth, Goldo finally gives in, remarking that Laruku is quite stubborn. Laruku playfully responds, You too, Mr. Goldo. Goldo finally accepts and says, Don't forget to tell me if you need anything, okay? Afterward, as the pair makes their way through town, people start approaching and surrounding Goldo, showing admiration and affection. They invite him for drinks and even offer him free items. After a while, the pair manages to escape the crowd. Goldo looks at Laruku and asks, Is your cheek all right? They didn't mean to hurt you. Laruku responds that he is fine and admits he wasn't aware that Mr. Goldo is this popular with the people in the city. Goldo, a bit taken aback, says, Hmm, is that so? True, I hardly talk to other people in the guild after all. When I got this scar on my face, I became much scarier than before, so I'm used to being alone most of the time now. Laruku comes to a sudden halt, his gaze fixed on Goldo's scar. About that scar, he begins, but Goldo, momentarily distracted, interrupts with, We're here. Turning back to Laruku, he apologizes and asks, Sorry, what were you asking? Flustered and a bit embarrassed, Laruku stammers, Oh, nothing. It's fine. There's a lingering curiosity in Laruku's eyes, but he chooses not to pursue the topic further. The duo then steps into what appears to be an inn, and they are greeted by a man named Dats. You're finally here, he exclaims. Goldo, a bit surprised, responds, So you knew I was coming? Dats explains, That's because my brother came yesterday and told me you would be bringing some kid called Laruku, and I should prepare a room. Fritz did. I see, Goldo responds, visibly relieved. Dats introduces himself, saying, You're Laruku, right? I am Dats the owner of Small Bear Lodging. I'm also the younger brother of Fritz, who's the guild cafeteria manager. Nice to meet you. Laruku acknowledges the introduction and notes the striking resemblance between the two brothers. Dats can't help but remark that Laruku is quite mature for his age. He then asks, So how long will you be staying? Goldo considers and replies, Let's see. For now, make it one month with breakfast and lunch meals included. Okay. Wait a moment, please. A whole month's worth of money? Laruku expresses concern about the potential expense. Ha ha ha, you see? Gordo is the only reason I still have a business in this city. This guy is the city savior. That's why I let Gildo and any of his companions stay here for free unconditionally. Though he hardly comes here. Dats chuckles. He then turns around and asks Imelda, You're fine with this as well, right? Of course, I will never reject a request for Mr. Gordo. I am this person's wife. Imelda affirms with a warm smile. Nice to meet you, Laruku. Thank you. I'll gladly take you up on your generous offer then. Laruku expresses his gratitude to Imelda. Come on. Lunch will be ready soon, so after bringing in your luggage, make your way to the cafeteria at once. Imelda kindly instructs Laruku. I will? Laruku responds appreciatively. I will. I'll return to the guild. Dats, Imelda, I'm counting on you. And Laruku, don't forget to come to the guild tomorrow, Goldo says before he departs. Mr. Goldo, thank you very much for today. Laruku expresses his gratitude, waving as Mr. Goldo walks away. We jump to the morning where birds are chirping outside, and Laruku begins to wake up. We then transition to Laruku having a shower using his water magic. He remarks that the idea of using his water magic isn't a bad one, but he still wishes that he could have a proper shower someday. Laruku curiously contemplates what changes might have occurred in his status, and decides to give it a closer inspection. Suddenly, a realization dawns upon him. His strength has noticeably increased, and a new layer of protection, known as Magilt Divine Protection, has emerged. This divine shield enhances the power of all magic attributes. Baffled by this unexpected boon, Laruku ponders whether another benevolent deity has lent their power to him. Filled with gratitude, he decides to offer a prayer, expressing thanks to the generous god for the newfound strength and protection. Then what should I do about this? After all, we don't have a washing machine here, Laruku says, eyeing his soiled clothes. Inspired, he hatches a plan. Adding soap to the mix, he employs his wind magic to spin the water at a rapid pace. Simultaneously, his water magic replaces the grimy water, creating a makeshift mini-washing machine. 
Laruku successfully completes the laundry, wearing a satisfied expression. Magic is the best, he remarks happily. He then makes his way to the cafeteria and enjoys a sandwich, remarking that having a proper meal is an absolute blessing. Suddenly, a girl's voice chimes in, asking, Hey, are you Laruku? Laruku responds affirmatively, and the young girl introduces herself, saying, You look close to my age, I'm Anna. Just call me Anna, okay? Miss Anna, nice to meet you, Laruku says with a cheerful face. However, Anna seems to disapprove, insisting, Just call me Anna, expressing a desire for a more casual interaction. Laruku responds with an okay, feeling a bit perplexed by the girl's behavior. Suddenly, Anna's mom appears, scolding her daughter for being late for school. Anna exclaims, I forgot, and quickly adds, see you later then, Laruku, before running off. Sorry for the racket. That was our daughter. Please get along with her, Anna's mom apologizes. Yes, I will, Laruku responds happily. What a lively girl. Well, time to finish my meal. Suddenly, a group of men approaches Laruku, saying, Hey, kid, there's something we want to ask you. A bit nervous, Laruku responds cautiously with a, Yes. The scene then shifts to three men, now visibly moved to tears, exclaiming, Who would abandon a good kid like you? Your parents must be evil. So you're with Mr. Goldo, huh? Don't hesitate to ask us anything, they assure Laruku. Dats interjects, observing, You seem to be getting quite popular. Confused, Laruku asks, did I do something? It becomes apparent that the men are just thrilled that Laruku is engaging with them normally. Adventurers like them are often misjudged due to their appearance. Sympathetically, Laruku inquires, By the way, do you have plans after this? I'm planning to visit the guild. One of the adventurers responds, Why don't you tag along with us? We also need to deliver something. Laruku eagerly agrees, saying, Yes, please. The adventurer blushes, impressed by Laruku's politeness and good manners. Before they depart, Laruku gathers the courage to ask, All right, why does everyone avoid using Mr. Goldo's reception desk? The man, looking a bit uncomfortable, begins to explain, Well, there's a reason behind that. Ten years ago, a dragon attacked the city. Unfortunately, it was the same time a labyrinth was discovered pretty far from the capital, so a great number of adventurers, both high-ranking and novices, were already on their way to investigate. Only Goldo was left in the city. He fought with all his might and defeated the dragon, protecting the city from destruction. However, this cost him his right eye and left leg. The adventurers that went to the labyrinth only found out once it was over. I'm fully aware that he's not the type of person to scold us, but still it's frustrating whenever I think that our presence could have saved him and his career as an adventurer. So that's what Dats meant, Laruku recalls, reflecting on all the good things the city residents have said to Mr. Goldo and how nice they have been to him. In that case, why are the adventurers outside the city? Laruku ponders aloud. Well, that's obvious, probably because his face is scary, he adds with a look of sadness. The chapter begins with Laruku arriving at the guild and wondering about Mr. Goldo's whereabouts. Suddenly, he hears his name being called and turns around to find Mr. Goldo whispering for him to come quietly. Excitedly, Laruku greets Mr. Goldo, who hushes him while visibly sweating. They enter a room where Goldo, being vigilant, checks for anyone nearby. Laruku questions the reason for Goldo's sudden caution before Goldo reveals a pouch full of gold. Laruku starts counting the coins and exclaims about the 30 silver coins. Goldo urges him to take it, but Laruku, surprised, insists on knowing why. He pushes the pouch back to Goldo, stating that he can't accept it without understanding the reason. Goldo, taken aback, explains that it's Laruku's reward for organizing the warehouse the day before. Laruku expresses excitement at the substantial reward. Goldo explains that although the guild usually assigns this quest to new adventurers with a longer time frame, Laruku handled it independently, earning him the full reward. It may seem like a significant sum for a newcomer, but a seasoned adventurer can earn it in a day, Goldo remarks. To avoid any commotion, we should keep this reward confidential, he instructs, with Laruku agreeing. Goldo then discloses, the person who saved you is an acquaintance of mine. Excited, Laruku seizes the opportunity to inquire about his savior. He mentioned that if someone comes with his letter and shows potential, I should train them as an adventurer, Goldo reveals. That's the story, Laruku says, casting his gaze downward.
The mystery of why he went to such lengths to care for me has always puzzled me, he adds, a tinge of disappointment crossing his face. Guldo reassures Laruku, confirming that he was indeed asked to help, but emphasizes that he did it out of genuine fondness. You possess great potential, after all, Guldo affirms. Thank you very much, Laruku says, visibly happy and blushing. He then inquires about the nature of his savior. Guldo, making an effort to recall after a while, shares, He's not a bad person, but he tends to keep his distance from others. Several years ago, he set out to settle some matters and hasn't returned since. Guldo, appearing a bit occupied, apologizes and suggests postponing the discussion for another day. I understand, Laruku responds, though he admits his curiosity about his savior's background. Recognizing the difficulty of the topic, he decides to wait for the right time. Well, I doubt this will compensate, but Goldo begins as he pulls a curtain, unveiling an array of weapons. Pick any weapon you like, and I'll make sure to train you thoroughly, he says, giving a thumbs up. Laruku, in disbelief, asks if it's really fine. Overwhelmed with choices, he recalls, I believe I had some proficiency in short swordsmanship. Without hesitation, Laruku declares, I'll go with a short sword, please. We then see a montage of Laruku and Goldo training, with Goldo surprised by Laruku's rapid progress in just four days. However, Laruku appears annoyed that he couldn't even scratch Mr. Goldo. Goldo encourages him, acknowledging his decent performance for a first mock battle and asserting that his experience hasn't dulled enough to be defeated by a rookie. Goldo expresses sadness over Laruku being expelled from his house despite his promising potential. He then wonders how Laruku discovered his skills. Uncertain about revealing the truth, Laruku decides to lie, pretending to be oblivious. When I was thrown out, I was looking at an unknown fruit, and then something like a screen popped up. That's when I realized I had an appraisal skill, he explains. I see, says Goldo, a look of shock on his face as he realizes Laruku has an appraisal skill. Goldo suggests, can't you succeed as a merchant too? Laruku vehemently rejects the idea, exclaiming, I prefer being an adventurer. Changing the topic, Goldo mentions that Laruku will be receiving magic lessons from the master. Surprised, Laruku asks about Fia, and Goldo explains, she might not look it, but her magic prowess is considered top class in this country. Be sure to study hard with her. In the headmaster's office, Laruku is seated at a desk, ready for Miss Fia's lesson. Before the lesson commences, Fia inquires about Laruku's magical attributes. Without hesitation, Laruku lists 10 attributes. Fire, wind, water, earth, light, darkness, lightning, ice, holy, and void magic. A hint of confusion crosses Fia's face, prompting Laruku to ask if it's too many or too few. Fia replies, it's a lot, and then questions if Laruku is aware of the total number of magical attributes. Laruku admits, no, I've never read the books or had the opportunity for someone to teach me, with a tinge of sadness. Fia, with a determined look, decides to postpone magical training for the moment. Instead, she suggests focusing on acquainting Laruku with the common knowledge of this world to prevent such challenges in the future. Let's put magic training on hold and get you familiar with the basics of this world's knowledge first, so you won't encounter this kind of problem again, okay? Starting today, your training sessions with Goldo will be in the morning and you'll be studying with me in the afternoon, okay? Laruku, feeling a bit overwhelmed, remarks, that's quite a challenging schedule. The next morning, the scene shifts, and Laruku is seen sulking, anticipating another day of strenuous work. A peculiar man takes a seat beside him, offering a greeting. Laruku reciprocates and inquires about the man's identity. After a brief pause, the man introduces himself as Guldo's friend, injecting a playful tone into his words. Laruku, feeling a sense of suspicion, wonders about the pause in the man's response. Is that so sorry, but Mr. Guldo is probably busy with work. The man responds, oh no, the one I came to meet is you. Laruku, puzzled, looks around, only to notice that everyone present refuses to make eye contact with him. Perplexed, Laruku questions, why does everyone avoid looking me in the eyes? Just as the confusion mounts, Goldo arrives, attempting to comfort Laruku, but his attention is diverted to the strange man. Why the hell are you here? Goldo confronts the man who nonchalantly replies, I heard an intriguing rumor and decided to join in the fun. 
Goldo, now in a state of panic, ushers the two individuals to the headmaster's office. The headmaster appears visibly annoyed at the sudden appearance of the peculiar man. The man then casually remarks, Long time no see, master. Geez, even though I kept asking you to inform me if something interesting happens. Intrigued, Laruku turns to Goldo and inquires if the person is Miss Fia's disciple. Goldo confirms, adding that he is, in fact, the king of the country. Laruku, feeling a sense of panic, questions if it's appropriate for a king to embark on such a playful excursion. The strange man, introduced as Ars Arachomatus, clarifies that he's technically a king, but suggests calling him Ars freely, since he is currently not within his castle. As Laruku attempts to introduce himself, Goldo interrupts, striking the young man and questioning whether Queen Ima is aware of this situation. Ars, now showing signs of unease, acknowledges that he is indeed here, without permission. Goldo, having confirmed his suspicion, asks the headmaster to send the king back to the castle. The headmaster promptly creates a portal, sending Ars back. With Ars gone, Goldo remarks that the king is quite a handful. He explains that while Ars is exceptionally skilled in magic, swordsmanship, and various other fields, his personality is flawed. Ars tends to focus only on things that greatly intrigue him, neglecting his responsibilities and meddling in the affairs of others. The headmaster, clearly annoyed and tired, announces that they should call it a day and turn in. The following morning, Laruku awakens to find a letter placed next to his bed. Curious, he hands it to Goldo, who appears furious upon reading it. The letter bears the king's seal, inviting Laruku and Goldo to the castle. Laruku wonders if the seal holds great significance, and Goldo confirms its importance, explaining that it is infused with magic from the royal family. Disregarding the invitation would be seen as disobeying a royal order, prompting the dispatch of royal guards to apprehend them, an outcome that has landed Goldo in trouble in the past. In light of this, Goldo deems it best to comply and head to the castle. Shortly after arriving at the castle, Laruku comments on its considerable size, and Goldo agrees, noting that even compared to other countries, this castle stands in a league of its own. Goldo then adds that right after becoming king, the monarch used the funds he earned to expand the castle, reasoning that a larger castle is better. Curious, Laruku inquires if the king earned the money himself. Goldo confirms this, explaining that the king was once an adventurer. While adventuring started as part of his training, he rapidly climbed the ranks, completing various quests and accumulating a substantial fortune. Laruku expresses his difficulty in picturing the king as a monarch, and Goldo seems to share the same sentiment. The duo arrives at the castle and are guided by one of the maids to the king's study. The maid announces the arrival of Laruku's friends, to which Ars responds with a simple, I understand. Suddenly, screams erupt from within, prompting Goldo to push open the door and enter, shouting the king's name. However, he soon realizes that the king is buried under a pile of documents. The king, emerging from the paperwork, greets them, saying good morning. Visibly enraged, Goldo dismisses the pleasantries and chastises the king for using the royal seal for such trivial matters, emphasizing that it should be reserved for important issues. The king defends himself, asserting that it was an act of cowardice for Goldo to chastise him while he was immobilized and defenseless under the burden of numerous documents. Goldo pulls him up, and the king expresses his gratitude. The king then jokingly suggests that Goldo wouldn't have come unless he used the seal, pointing to it. Having reached his limit, Goldo declares his departure. In response, the king mentions that the reason he summoned Goldo concerns Laruku. Goldo, taken aback, reluctantly acquiesces and settles into a seat, remarking, You should inform me of these matters earlier. As the scene unfolds, the king turns his attention to Laruku, questioning whether he has faced expulsion from his own home. In response, Goldo, brimming with indignation, interjects with objections. Laruku, aiming to pacify Goldo, collaborates with the king, acknowledging not only the title of an abandoned child, but also the weight of being nameless. The king, visibly agitated and fraught with frustration, comments, So, they've even stripped you of your name. His anger so palpable that he inadvertently cuts his hand from the forceful clenching. The king offers an apology for inadvertently stirring up Laruku's past, to which Laruku responds with a calm assurance. 
Subsequently, the king unveils a document that appears to be a death certificate dispatched by a specific noble. The document details the demise of a child who fell victim to a horde of monsters in the forest. Laruku, visibly disturbed by this revelation, listens as the king suggests that the senders are likely his erstwhile parents, thereby implying that the presented document serves as his own death certificate. Laruku and his father were sitting together with a man who said that the document in his hand was most likely Laruku's death certificate. Margildo was worried and asked who they were trying to fool since Laruku was alive right there. The man replied that he couldn't help but notice that the features described in the death certificate matched Laruku's. The death certificate said that the deceased was a boy notable for his incompetence and had gray hair. Laruku looked at the certificate and confirmed that the name of the issuer was indeed his former parents. The man, putting his hand on his chin, said that there was one part of the certificate that made him curious, the incompetence part. He said that he had heard from his master that Laruku was a fine adventurer with promising potential and that a few days ago he was informed by the spy he assigned to watch over Laruku that he had been practicing magic. He wondered what was up with the incompetence part. Mr. Guildo, with a serious face, asked why the man wanted to know that. The man said that it was nothing important. He just wanted to know how someone who was exiled for having no skills could use magic. He apologized to Laruku and asked if he could explain. After looking at Laruku for a moment, the man said he understood and thought to himself that it was the god's veil with the camouflage effect a top-class ability that stood out among the special abilities. He thought that it was quite amazing. Laruku also thought to himself that when he was exiled, he thought it was a disaster, but now that he saw how much fun life was, he was actually glad that it happened. He smiled as he thought this. Mr. Guildo, with a straight face, said that if the man's business was done with them, they would be leaving now. The man begged him to sit down as Guildo tried to stand up. He said that it had been ages since Guildo came to the castle and asked him to stay the night. He asked if he had any other business to attend to. Guildo said that he had to take Laruku to an inn afterwards. The man held Laruku's shoulder and smiled widely. He said that in that case, they could just have Laruku stay as well. Guildo looked at him and asked what his objective was. The man told Gildo that yesterday he went to the guild and because of that, his wife, Emma the Queen, had been angry. He said that he had thought of inviting some guests over to appease her anger. Guildo said to Laruku that they were leaving. As Guildo turned back to walk out of the door, the man grabbed his leg and begged Gildo to think about saving a friend. Laruku asked, what kind of person Miss Emma was. Gildo replied that she was the man's wife and also the queen. The man was Alice. He also said that when it came to Alice's wife, she was the only person that he was no match for. The man pleaded with Guildo not to be like that. Guildo tossed Alz away from his leg. He looked at Laruku and said that someone had issued his death certificate. He said that he had every right to be angrier. Laruku looked back at him with an innocent eye, as if he didn't know what Guildo was talking about. He said that the fact that Guildo got angry on his behalf was more than enough for him. Guildo rubbed his hair while Laruku chuckled. Alz called out to them, saying that they were being all friendly over there. He said that since it had come to this, he would just have to use force. He drew his sword and told Guildo to get ready. Guildo was furious and called Alz a bastard. Alz replied that Guildo could say whatever he wanted, but he was not going to let Laruku leave. They started to spar, and Guildo told Laruku to duck when Alz used his ice magic. Guildo turned to the guards who were watching and asked them why they didn't stop Alz from causing trouble. One of them said they were sorry, but they had royal orders not to interfere. They continued to fight, and Guildo told Laruku to cover his ears. When their swords clashed, Guildo let out a loud roar that made everyone who heard it dizzy. Laruku felt a bit dizzy too. Even though he had covered his ears, Guildo's magic was powerful. Then Emma arrived at the scene. She was beautiful and had some royal guards behind her. Gildo asked her whose side she was on. Laruku was shocked to see that Emma was the one they had described. She was beautiful and had a lovely smile. Gildo said that if he had the queen's permission, he wouldn't hold back. The queen gave him her permission, and he fought Alz with full strength. The whole place turned into chaos as smoke and dust filled the air. Emma moved closer to Laruku and held his hand. She said she was the king's wife, Emma, and it was nice to meet him. Laruku thanked her for having him. He felt like he had gotten to know the royal family a lot through Mr. Gildo, just between yesterday and today. As the noise of the fight went on, Emma said that Owls was such an idiot king. Then one of the guards came over to the queen, and the queen said she was really sorry for making him keep an eye on the king so he wouldn't run away. He said it was no big deal and told the queen not to worry. The queen told him she was counting on him to give Owls a proper punishment. 
The guard said yes and told the queen to leave it to him. Gildo and Laruku heard this, and Laruku asked if Al's would be okay. Al said yes and said that Laruku was so kind. He asked Gildo if he was still not staying over with them. Gildo said he didn't mind, since there was no more trouble. Al's asked Laruku what he thought about staying over. Laruku's face lit up with happiness, and he said he was okay with spending the night in the royal palace. He shouted Yai in his mind and told Al's he would also stay over. As the queen walked with Laruku and Mr. Gildo, she murmured to herself and secretly made a peace sign with her fingers. Laruku asked Mr. Gildo how he became acquainted with Al's and his family. Mr. Gildo said that they were all adventurers back then, and they naturally became friends while taking on quests together. Laruku's face brightened as he realized that Mr. Gildo was implying that the queen used to be an adventurer. He was shocked to hear that the queen was once a beautiful and cheerful noble girl who was betrothed to Al's. She was also a bit of an oddball who decided to follow Al's when he became an adventurer. She turned out to be as talented as Al's and was unstoppable, saying that they were a perfect match. Laruku wondered if Mr. Gildo felt nervous around royalty, but Mr. Gildo said that he regarded them as friends who were slightly different. He also said that acknowledging them as royalty would be insulting to the royals of other countries. Ama glanced back at them with a snake-like expression, saying that she was not offended and that she was pretty normal except for Al's. Laruku thought that a proper queen would not show such blatant bloodlust. The queen moved closer to Laruku and told him that Mr. Gwildo was saying weird things. She told Laruku not to believe him and smiled widely. She invited Laruku to join them for their first meal together. At the dinner table, a young boy approached Mr. Gildo and greeted him. The boy's name was Rio, and Mr. Gildo commented that he had grown a lot. Rio said that three years was enough time to grow up. He looked down at Laruku and asked who he was. He wondered who the small kid was. Laruku also wondered who the boy was. Rio asked Mr. Gildo if he had gotten married and had a kid. He asked why he didn't invite him to the wedding. Mr. Gildo said that it was nothing like that and explained that he was Laruku's guardian. Then Rio introduced himself calmly. He said that he was Alsa's eldest son, Riola, a Rakamides. He said that it was nice to meet Laruku. Laruku said that he was honored to meet him and that his name was Laruku. Rio told Laruku to call him by his nickname instead of his full name. He laughed and said that it was more friendly. Laruku was shocked and said that he couldn't address the prince by a nickname. They shook hands and Rio told him that it was only inappropriate in public. He said that he wanted Laruku to call him Rio in private. He said that it would make him happy. The queen came to the scene and said that Laruku could call her Miss Ima. She held Laruku's hand and said that she wouldn't let go until he called her by her name. Laruku was reluctant because he didn't want to disrespect the royals. Mr. Gildo saw that the royals were persistent and told Laruku that it was fine. He said that Laruku was already treating Alice as a non-royal by calling him Mr. Laruku agreed and called the prince Rio and the queen Miss Emma. They all seemed happy, especially the royals. Laruku had a slightly annoyed expression and thought that they were like children. They sat at the table to eat, and everything was delicious. Laruku noticed two young girls at the dinner table and wondered if they were Rio's sisters. He thought to himself that he would love to greet them properly. The queen came over to Laruku's seat and whispered in his ear that the bath would be ready after they were done eating. She asked him if he would like to take a bath. Laruku replied with excitement that he would love to. After the dinner, Gwildo and Laruku were seen soaking in the bathtub. Laruku commented that their bath was so huge. Gwildo said that it was because Als liked baths. Laruku thought to himself that a bath this huge was beyond the level of someone who liked baths. Then, Gildo got out of the bath and said that he would be leaving first, but Laruku could stay longer if he wanted to. Laruku said that he would stay behind a little longer. As Gildo walked out, he told Laruku not to overdo it. As Laruku soaked in the bath after Gildo left, he said to himself that baths were the best and that someday he would definitely get a house with a bath installed. The next day, Rio challenged Gildo to a fight, saying that he would show him that he had grown up a lot in three years. He told Gildo to brace himself. Gildo, with a carefree attitude and his sword on his shoulder, told Rio to charge at him anytime he wanted. Rio went up to Gildo to have a bit of mock battle with him. Gildo looked at his face that seemed like a lost puppy and thought to himself that Rio's face did not look like that of a person expecting a fight. They locked swords and started clashing. Rio created an opening by sliding Gildo's sword and Gwildo complimented him, saying that he was a fine swordsman with a fine swordsmanship, creating an opening like that, but he still had a long way to go. He then defeated Rio and stretched out his hand to lift him up from his knees. Rio praised him, saying that Gildo had not lost his touch at all. Gwildo replied that he had lost plenty of his touch, 
saying that Ryo's skill had greatly increased. The guards watching cheered for Ryo, saying that young master Ryo's growth had surpassed that of Sir Al's, and that the captain acknowledged that too. Ryo replied that it was not so, that he had not fully come to terms with it this time. He said that he still had a long way to go until he could catch up with either his father or Gildo. He then said to Gildo that he was not humble at all, and that he would surpass him in no time. Gildo smiled and said that he was looking forward to that. The queen and Laruku watched them from a distance, with Laruku commenting that they were both amazing. The queen smiled under her umbrella and walked up to Gildo, apologizing for Riolas's behavior. Gildo replied that she should not worry about it and that he had so much fun too. He thanked the queen for having them over and asked where Mr. Owls was. The queen answered with a sweet and devilish smile that he had an urgent matter to attend to and that she was sorry that he would not be seeing them off. Rio whispered to Laruku that he should not ask any more questions about Owls. Gildo agreed, saying that there were things better left unknown. Laruku's sharp mind quickly figured out the logic, and he concluded that he must be where he was being punished for the commotion he caused yesterday. Guildo and Laruku left the castle. A few days later, after being invited to the castle, Laruku trained with his master and Mr. Guildo. Though Laruku was back to his normal life, his desire to build a bath was still growing stronger and stronger. He said to himself that he wanted to be able to take baths whenever he wanted to, as soon as possible. He said that he had to do well as an adventurer and save money. The next day, Laruku was suddenly summoned by the guild, and he wondered what was wrong. As he reached the guild, he saw a wagon and thought that it was weird to see one at the guild. When he entered the guild, he saw a lady that he recognized, the one from the castle. He recognized the girl as someone he met in the castle the other day. The girl said that her name was Roselia, a Recomites. As the lady spoke to him, Laruku couldn't help but stare and feel flustered at the sight of the beautiful girl. Then his father suddenly showed up, apologizing for calling Laruku on such a short notice. He said that he needed his help with something regarding his daughter, Roselia, whose nickname was Leah. Laruku introduced himself to the young girl, saying that he was Laruku, the one who left without greeting her the other day. He thought to himself that the young girl was a docile girl and that she didn't resemble Als much. He smiled widely as he reasoned this. The young girl was obviously blushing a little as they talked. She said that people who were close to her often called her Leah, and she would like it if Mr. Laruku could call her Leah too. She played with her hair as she said these words. Laruku had a bit of a disappointed expression in his mind. He thought that after all, they shared the same blood. He talked about the rest of her family. The maid offered them tea to drink, and Laruku thanked her very much. Al stated that he heard from Laruku's master the other day that he excelled at his studies, and so he thought he would employ him as Leah's personal private tutor. Laruku replied that he just heard private tutor. He said that he would like to do Al's a favor, but he had a tight schedule. Laruku's master interrupted him, saying that he should consider allocating the time he spent studying with her to working as a private tutor instead. Laruku wore an expression that he had been dejected. He thought to himself that after being abandoned by his parents, he would be abandoned by Miss Fia, his teacher too. As if his teacher could read his mind, Miss Fia continued, saying that Laruku had gotten it all wrong. She said that it was not that she gave up on him, and that he shouldn't feel that way. She continued, saying that she had already taught Laruku everything that one must learn in school. But due to Laruku's exceptionally good memory, it became more fun for her to teach him all sorts of stuff. She said that the recent books she had been handing to Laruku were mostly so technically advanced that even well-read elves didn't know about them. Laruku thought to himself, no wonder the recent books seemed unusually thick. Laruku said to Owls that he didn't mind, but he had to practice magic in his schedule. Owls then replied that in that case, he would teach him how once he was done with his private tutor duties. He said that despite looking like this, he was his master's best disciple. He swung his hand around to perform magic and conjured a rose from the thin air. He gave it to Laruku, asking if he was okay learning magic from him. Laruku replied with a bright expression, saying that he was okay with it. Laruku went back home all happy with the magic rose and told Gildo that it had been decided that he would try his hand on being a private tutor for one month. Guildo reassured him that he would be fine, knowing his abilities. He said that going to the castle every day would be tough on Laruku, but Laruku disagreed. He said that he would be leaving with Miss Fia and Meals would be the one seeing him home. He also confided in Guildo that he felt uneasy about leaving the king and the guildmaster with those odd jobs. Guildo told him not to worry about that, since they were the ones who suggested it. He also told him not to feel like he was being spoiled by them. Laruku said that Miss Fia and Mr. Owls had said the same thing to him. Guildo then said, that from now on, after practicing with him in the morning, he would have his part-time job of sorting out the warehouse, then his private tutor work, followed by his magic practice. He praised Laruku for working so hard, but also warned him not to overdo it. Laruku promised to keep that in mind. 
Three weeks later, Laruku was teaching Leah, who asked him what to do in a certain situation as she wrote. Laruku quickly gave her the answer. Laruku was in his shed, thinking about how they had become much more relaxed around each other since they were so tense when they first started. He also thought that with how smart Leah was, they were almost done with the textbooks that Miss Fia had lent him. Once he finished his private tutor work, he reported his progress to Al's, who then helped him with his magic practice. In one of their practice sessions, Al's realized that he had not introduced Wallace to him. He asked Laruku to follow him and asked if he liked books. Laruku said that he did, since he learned many things that he didn't know from them. All said that he was sure that he and Wallace would get along well, since Wallace spent most of his time in the library. Alls opened the library door, and there he was, Wallace, reading a book and wearing glasses. Alls introduced him as his son, and Laruku greeted him as Laruku. Wallace said that Laruku must be the one who was tutoring Leah, and Laruku apologized for not greeting him sooner, even though he had been coming to the castle regularly. Wallace told him not to worry about it. Alls teased his son for being holed up in the library all the time, but Wallace adjusted his glasses and corrected his father. He said that he was not holed up but he just read the books that he wanted to read, and before he knew it, a whole day had passed. Wallace turned to Laruku and smiled, asking if he also liked books. Laruku said that he did, and that he had been reading history books about elves. He asked if Wallace wanted to read the book, and Wallace eagerly said that he would. Laruku handed him the book, and Wallace flipped through the pages, finding the book very interesting. Laruku said that he could lend him the book if he wanted, as long as he returned it the next time he came. Wallace was very happy and said that Laruku was welcome to visit the library anytime he wanted, since they were best friends after all. After using float magic to get home, Laruku thanked Alz for always seeing him home. All said it was fine, and that he should be the one thanking Laruku, because Leah had been getting a lot better. He gave Laruku five gold coins as his reward, and asked if Laruku would like to continue working as a private tutor. Laruku was very happy and said that he would love to. He thought in his mind that his dream bathtub was a step closer. As Alz was about to turn back and leave, he said to Laruku that there was one more thing he should stay on his guard. Laruku asked why he should do that. Al said that the royal capital's hero Guildo, the top-level magicians Fia and Lala, and himself the king, had all been favorable to Laruku. This made Laruku's political worth grow steadily. There was even talk about Laruku being abducted and forcefully made a foster child among the nobility. Alls continued, saying that he had crushed those plans with a smiling expression. He said that recently, such rumors were getting active again, and that he had a spy watching over Laruku for added measures. Laruku interrupted him, asking if he was talking about the man in black who followed him around. Alz was shocked that he knew about it. He said that Laruku must have received training from Guildo on how to sense signs of presence around him. Laruku replied yes, saying that he had done it only once, but he got praised, which was unusual. Al said that it was quite amazing, and that not many people could pull it off right off the bat. He thought in his mind that it was very fearsome. Alls then said that this set his mind at ease, but he would still like it very much if Laruku stayed on his guard. Laruku said okay, waving to him. As he went to bed, Laruku wondered if he had a skill that detected someone's presence. He said that it was high time he checked his status. When he pulled up his status, he was shocked to see that he had more skills than he expected. Presence detection was one of them. Another prominent skill was wordless incantation, which was the ability to increase one's magic and effect without chanting an incantation. He said to himself that he needed to try wordless incantation the next time. He prayed, saying that ever since Mr. Samadil reincarnated him to this world, he had been able to meet many people and all of them were kind-hearted. He said that when he died after a wicked god targeted him, he was worried about what the future held for him. But now, he was really glad he came here. He slept that night with a smile on his face after finishing his routine prayers, hoping he would properly reach Mr. Samadil. Laruku is having yet another hectic day as he gets ready for his session with his private tutor, studies magic, practices martial arts, and participates in all the guild's activities. Laruku is lonely and longs for a bath. A maid comes to his room and begs him to come to breakfast with the others. Mr. Doldos, the proprietor of the inn for various adventures, keeps an eye on Laruku. Mr. Doldos and his people assemble around Laruku, asking him about his well-being before informing him that a strange adventurer has arrived and cautioning him to avoid strangers for his own safety. Laruku treats the information lightheartedly and reassures them that they will be secure because other adventurers are encircling the guild. Mr. Doldos is adamant in his counsel, telling Laruku to contact the guild for help in the event of any likely unlucky events. Anna manages to get to Laruku and begs for his help. Despite being fully aware of the nature of Anna's mother's rage, Laruku unexpectedly agrees to tutor her on the condition that it happen at the end of the day when Anna shows him her subpar scripts and requests for help with her math in order to raise her grades.
The next day, after expressing her gratitude to Laruku with excitement, Anna starts her training and finds that everything goes according to plan until martial arts enters the picture. When Anna bemoans her failure to keep up with Laruku's progress in martial arts, Mr. Guldo, Laruku's guardian, comes to check on the children. Laruku appreciates and admires Guldo's skills, but Guldo has a low opinion of Laruku's martial arts prowess. When Guldo says that his artificial leg makes his martial arts skills useless, Laruku starts to regret not selecting healing magic the last time he had the chance to select a skill. He then wonders if that decision would have given him the chance to heal Goldo's leg injury. Upon noticing Laruku's sullen expression, Goldo gives him a little playful jab before telling him that Owls has called him to the castle and verifying that Laruku's route also leads to the same place. When Laruku offers that they go together, he does so with much excitement. Goldo, however, becomes enraged and yells at Laruku, while the latter trembles in dread and tries to explain that he is being targeted by the aristocracy due to his illegitimacy. Laruku is even more depressed after learning of an unexpected letter from his former parents that contains details and encourages him to visit them as they prepare to take him back, but he angrily declines. Goldo surmises that the letter might indicate that the intended use of Laruku for their own gain stems from Al's bloodlust for Laruku's former parents, which he contemplates using as a justification for various forms of harassment, such as stealing their court rank or something more heinous. Goldo backs Al as well because he exhibits bloodlust. Al describes the seriousness of their predicament and surmises that plans are being made to kidnap Laruku, endangering his safety. With a flurry of joy, Al stands up and offers Laruku and Goldo a suggestion. They think about formally forming a family. Al continues by mentioning Goldo's well-known status as the nation's hero, which would provide Laruku with leverage and ensure his protection. Al thinks that once news got out about Goldo's intention to formally adopt Laruku as his son, Laruku's predators would back down. After giving it some thought, Laruku gets excited about the idea and looks at Goldo, waiting for him to decide whether to accept or reject it. Goldo fidgets and acts restless at the thought, then grudgingly confirms with Laruku the abrupt turn of events. Laruku asks Goldo a curious question about his sincere belief that he is his father. When Laruku tells Goldo about his suspicious upbringing and peculiar personality as a child, Goldo responds positively, praising Laruku's character and saying that he has always appreciated his efforts in his studies and talents. After hearing Goldo's kind words, Laruku's face cheers up, and he agrees to adopt Goldo. Laruku refers to Goldo as his father for the time being and states his final decision. Goldo agrees and pats Laruku on the head. Al promises to take care of the adoption paperwork and issue it as soon as possible. Al approaches his office window and considers Laruku's previous parents. He believes they are unreformed individuals and considers the possibility of a storm that could soon approach them. A strange guy contemplates Goldo and Laruku's newfound bond as father and son, with a gleam in his eyes and an uneasy air. Another sunny dawn breaks, and Laruku gently wakes up from his slumber to discover he is in a strange place. That's when he learns he isn't in his customary lodge. Laruku turns as he tries to get up and, to his surprise, sees Goldo sound asleep on two different beds in the same room. Laruku looks at Goldo in disbelief, remembering how his day had gone the day before and how it had led to this unforeseen situation. Laruku remembers Al's working on the adoption paperwork and completing it in a meeting with Goldo. Al's then declares Goldo and Laruku to be a family. Laruku is surprised by the speed of the adoption procedure, but Al's defends it by citing Laruku's desertion. Laruku stammers when he tries to speak to Goldo using the fatherly term. Goldo laughs and asks Laruku to slow down. Al's face also lights up, joining in on their excitement and then savoring the happy moment between father and son. Al's tells Goldo and Laruku that it has been suggested that they reside in his castle while all the formalities are finished. He then grinned broadly and said that he would like Laruku to keep teaching his daughter, Leah. Laruku accepts Al's invitation to the castle and Goldo follows suit. Alls uses the distance between the inn and the castle as a measuring stick to get Laruku to think about his proposal. Laruku smiles broadly when he learns that staying at the castle entitles him to an endless supply of luxury bath products. Alls also asks Guldo to train his son, Riolas, who has been eager to meet Goldo for a long time. Goldo considers turning down Alls' request after reminding him of the circumstances surrounding his job. Alls keeps trying to get Guldo to take a vacation from his job 
and recuperate while teaching Riolas in his free time. After a year has passed since Laruku moved into his new surroundings in the castle on a bright and sunny afternoon, he follows a location that Leah has given him. He is intrigued about the possible meaning of the instruction, and as he enters a room, he is greeted with loud congratulations on his birthday. When Laruku tells Leah that he is surprised to have a birthday, Leah begins to cry as she listens to Laruku talk about how he celebrated his first birthday on that particular day. Als consoles Laruku by reminding him of his bond with a noble who's now his father, Guldo, and also about his birth certificate, then announces to Laruku about sharing the same birth date as Guldo. Laruku exclaims in amazement and runs to Guldo to confirm what he just learned. Guldo gives an answer to Guldo's questions, since he was unaware that he and Laruku had the same birthday. Laruku believes that their condition is predetermined by fate, but Goldo instantly acts out and chokes Laruku a little bit in order to conceal his humiliation from everyone else. As Laruku and Goldo resume their daily routines, they make the decision to take a bath together. Goldo observes Laruku's excitement as he steps into the water, and he then engages him in a conversation by utilizing his passion for baths. Goldo stares at Laruku in confusion while he is speaking as he tries to relate to the new perspective about baths. Laruku admits that he is a lover of baths and stares at his reason. Laruku believes that the best place to relieve stress or exhaustion from his daily activities is through bathing. Goldo becomes aware of the strange voice that interrupts their conversation, only to realize that it is Als. Goldo conceals his expression and gently suggests that Als not conceal his existence. Als joins the bath and ultimately announces his presence by agreeing with Laruku's idea about bathing. However, Laruku seems surprised at Als's presence, and Goldo asks Als not to conceal his presence. When Als gives Laruku a pat on the head and compliments him for every assistance that has been shown to him, Laruku takes a moment to reflect on Al's compliment and develops a different perspective on it. Laruku finds the work that he does for Als to be less taxing and easier. Laruku helps Al's with arithmetic calculations and paperwork sorting. When Laruku thinks about the whole situation, he is overcome with feelings of thankfulness. He is grateful to Al's for constantly compensating his efforts handsomely, regardless of the level of difficulty of the work that is being assigned to him. Guldo is caught off guard when Laruku asks him about the fact that his house also has a bathroom. Laruku rants in amazement because he has been secretly saving up to buy a house that has a bathroom and he also begins to regret not asking about such information from the beginning. Guldo makes an effort to interrogate Laruku about his saving habits and comes to the conclusion that he should continue saving. Guldo recommends Laruku to continue saving since adventurers like him would require money for a variety of activities such as the replacement of weapons and the purchase of apparatus. As a result of their chat, Als inquires about Laruku's desire in enrolling in the Lactoria Academy, and Goldo provides him with information regarding the non-discrimination act that the Academy requires its students to abide by. Laruku finds out that the Lactoria Academy is open to applicants of all different ranks and backgrounds, from commoners to members of respectable royal houses like Leah and Wallace. This indicates that the Academy is accepting recruits from all walks of life. As Als continues to inform Laruku about the school, he goes on to explain that the Academy provides students with the opportunity to work simultaneously as adventurers in addition to providing instruction in swordsmanship and magic. Als confesses his intentions to enroll Laruku in the Academy the following year. Laruku immediately realizes Al's true intentions with his admission into the Academy, which is to attend the same school with his daughter, Leah, because of her recent anxiety with coping with the transfer process, Al's smirks at Laruku's ability to deduce his true intentions from the unexpected news. Goldo instantly interrupts Laruku and scolds him for tasking oneself with so many duties. After that, he explains probable events that could injure Laruku on his route to school. Laruku considers the possibility of having to move to another world to attend school, and he agrees to Al's offer. While Goldo voices his fears about the possibility that Laruku may be intimidated or attacked by nefarious individuals, Laruku is able to persuade Guldo to agree with his decision, and Als is ecstatic about the outcome. After Guldo interrupts the happy moment by announcing his decision to train Laruku even more in order to better prepare him for any potentially dangerous circumstances that may arise, Laruku immediately turns to Als in an attempt to intervene in the situation and prevent his father from being extra. However, Als, to everyone's surprise, manages to escape the situation and does not offer any solution. 
Due to the fact that Guldo is concerned about his role as a father, Laruku considers Guldo's activities to be extreme. Meanwhile, Goldo continues to draw out a schedule for them to begin their rigorous training. Leah and Laruku arrive at the Lactoria Academy to take part in the entrance examinations in order to earn admittance into the academy. As they make their way to the examination, Leah shouts for Laruku and sends her warmest wishes. As Laruku makes his way inside the examination room, he takes a moment to reflect on the rigorous training that Goldo has been providing him with ever since he learned about his interest in the Lactoria Academy. He then expresses his optimism that he would be able to apply all of the teachings he has learned to any examination that he may be required to take. Laruku is able to find his way into the hall where he will take his first examinations. As he enters the classroom, he encounters other applicants as well as a teacher who introduces himself as Carl. Carl is a magic instructor at the school. Carl begins the examination with the written component of the magic examination. He then uses magic to distribute individual scripts, and Laruku, to his surprise, identifies the type of magic that was used to begin his examinations. The realization that the material that Laruku had previously studied with Leah is included on the exam causes him to exclaim in shock. Having prior knowledge of the answers enables Laruku to finish them and then proceed to submit them. Laruku signals Carl to dismiss him immediately and not make a fuss, and Carl passes over a form to Laruku and orders him to transfer to the second examination hall. Carl expresses his surprise at Laruku's abilities to have finished his exam in just 15 minutes from the beginning of the assessment period. Laruku enters the hall and discovers a young woman eagerly waiting. She informs Laruku that he is the first applicant to step into the hall and reveals her assumptions. The woman then immediately begins the examination and provides an explanation of the instructions for the practical magic examination. She enlightens Laruku on the purpose of the test, which is to measure his precision, and she also leaves a condition, which is for Laruku to not destroy any target or use a special sort of magic. Laruku is allowed 100 seconds to hit several targets with magic without crossing a specific line. She also leaves a condition that Laruku must maintain. Before beginning, Laruku gives a positive response. He studies his environment and detects that his targets are numerous. However, he also decodes a meaning to it, he is required to maintain a decent degree of speed and accuracy, and because he has rehearsed such a procedure with Mr. Owls on multiple occasions, Laruku begins his examination. Laruku is overcome with fatigue as he exerts all of his energy to focus intently throughout the test. The woman gives him a paper and tells him to move on to the next exam. During the exam, Laruku notes his shortcomings in the hopes that they won't likely cause problems. When Laruku arrives at the next hall, he discovers a male invigilator sleeping. He approaches and yells at him, waking him up. The invigilator then erupts in terror and defends his reasons for being discovered sleeping, saying that it was because he arrived at the hall early. Laruku is then given the order to select any weapon from a shelf. When Laruku looks at the weapons, he discovers that they have been dulled. The invigilator, Morris, the fight training instructor, introduces himself and says that the third exam is a weapons duel that Laruku must participate in without the aid of magic. Before Morris reveals the exam's premise, Laruku and Morris exchange formal greetings. Laruku has to hit Morris simply once to get through the exam stage. Laruku comes at Morris with his sword and deflects his blows, but after a while, his confidence wanes and he starts to shake since he hasn't been able to hit Morris in the right place. Laruku also knows that if Morris hits his body, it will make him more likely to fail. Laruku decides to use the strength amplification technique he learned from Owls during one of his training sessions, so he teleports behind Morris in an attempt to assault him, but he is unsuccessful since Morris manages to break free of his hold. Seeing that Morris might be playing a practical joke on him, Laruku chooses to use his strength amplification technique on his leg. Morris drops his guard, and Laruku takes full advantage of the situation by charging at him quickly. Rather than being adamant about his previous action, Morris, who was lying on the ground in shock, asks Laruku to give him his form so that he can get his passing stamp. Morris notices Goldo's surname on the form and understands that Laruku is Goldo's son. Morris greets Laruku with joy and says he knows Goldo, his father. Morris also congratulates Laruku on passing the exam and getting accepted into the academy. Laruku goes home to his family to share his day's happenings after learning from the academy's receptionist that the exam results will be sent out in the next two days. After Laruku's admission exams the following day, Alz and Laruku happen to cross paths in the hallway. Alz strikes up a conversation, calls out to Laruku, 
and gives him the message Wallace sent him. When Laruku suddenly sees the message Wallace sent him, he takes off quickly and sends Owls a note of gratitude. Owls is surprised by Laruku's rapid increase in speed. Wallace answers that he has been able to locate the agreement and hopes that Laruku will use it for its intended purpose after hearing an odd sound coming from his door and realizing it is Laruku's sly presence regarding the Owl's message. Laruku then approaches Wallace's ear to confirm their agreement. Laruku's face lights up with delight as he holds the book in his hands. The entertaining methods for cultivating rice are depicted in the book, and even the glitter in his eyes shines so brightly. As he gets ready to leave the library, Laruku gives Wallace a tight hug and keeps saying, Thank you! Wallace allows Laruku to keep the book because he keeps the library up to date. Laruku returns to the castle to see what is in his room. While looking at the handwritten book, he is impressed by the author's writing style because, after all, the man travels the world to promote rice. When Guldo emerges from the water and enters the room, he discovers Laruku lost in a book. Laruku gives a quick reply before turning back to the book. After seeing the value of asking Wallace about rice at first, Laruku decides to put off finishing his reading in order to take a bath. When Laruku expresses his wish to ask Guldo a question, Guldo relents and enjoys the cool water. Laruku tells his father that he has seen some obvious changes in his height and sword-wielding prowess, and he asks permission from Goldo to leave town. Laruku persists in his request and uses his enrollment in the Lactoria Academy as a condition for granting such a request. Goldo refuses to change his mind. Laruku grows uncomfortable with his father's excessive protection regarding such issues and labels it as a bad thing. Goldo immediately declines such permission and then reminds Laruku of how unfriendly and not as safe as Laruku imagines it to be. Laruku pouts and adopts an attitude when Goldo begs him not to worry about his safety. However, when Riolas joins them in the bath, things get better. Rio remarks on Laruku's body, mentioning that it has been a while since they last spoke. Laruku credits his physical appearance to the daily trainings he receives from his father, Guldo. When Rio interrupts Laruku and tells them that Owls has called them to his study, Rio also discusses Rio's physical progress. Rio also taunts Guldo about their upcoming second combat, and Guldo questions Al's abrupt message. Laruku and Guldo end up having a competition since they won't get out of the bath. Because of his preference for taking baths, Laruku believes he will win. After much back and forth about Guldo's complaint about the bath's higher temperature, Guldo eventually gives Laruku a lift to Al's office, where Al's tells Laruku that the headmaster has called him and needs him to come to the academy right away. Laruku is shocked because he thinks the time for the release of the Rai results hasn't arrived. He rushes to the academy and finds out that the Lactoria Academy has rejected his application. Laruku is disappointed to hear this news, and Goldo and Al's inquisitively ask for an explanation. The headmistress explains that the reason for the rejection is Laruku's excellent scores, leading them to conclude that the academy is unable to provide Laruku with appropriate lectures. She counters him by disclosing the degree of his genius, and she further recounts the shock that occurred to them after learning about a young boy having won the fighting training match with Morris. Laruku vents out to the headmistress about the problems he encountered throughout the exam, but she counters him by showing the extent of his brilliance. The headmistress proposes that Laruku utilize his abilities to get experience acting as either an explorer or a castle protector. Goldo eventually speaks out and screams out the name of the headmistress, revealing that her name is Neza. After listening to Goldo, Neja immediately has a change of heart and announces her decision to accept Laruku after she has apologized for her previous decision. Goldo is attempting to convince Neza of the reasons why Laruku's admission should be reconsidered because he believes there is more to gain at the academy than just studying. Owls welcomes Laruku's decision to move in with Goldo once his transfer date at the academy is announced. Leah meets with Laruku to discuss his departure and conveys her loss in her eyes. Alls also acknowledges that her eyes are filled with sadness. Leah receives solace from Alls, who also gives her permission to visit Laruku at regular intervals in order to play. Guldo and Laruku leave the castle, and Guldo knows that they will be confronted with some difficulties upon their return, particularly with regard to feeding, because they are accustomed to the luxury that they experienced at the castle. Laruku reassures Guldo that they will survive, and he offers to prepare the meals because he has a magic technique that can be utilized for that purpose. Goldo tells the ordeal he went through and how the town inhabitants decided to surprise him by conducting a thorough makeover on his house. 
Laruku is welcomed into a massive mansion where Guldo lives alone. Guldo explains that when they were on their way home, they stopped to grab groceries. When Laruku has finished successfully preparing his first meal, he is given the responsibility of handling the dishes that have been prepared. At this point, it has been a few days since Goldo and Laruku began their voyages of love together as father and son. Goldo appears to be enjoying Laruku's delicacies to such an extent that even Laruku finds it pleasurable to respond to his demands when it comes to food. Goldo makes an offer to help with the cleaning of the dishes rather than not contributing, but Laruku declines the offer and proposes that Goldo take a bath instead. As a result, Goldo gets a sense of guilt because Laruku is responsible for the majority of the work in the house, and he apologizes for his behavior. When Laruku realizes that he hasn't accomplished anything, he goes to his bedroom, where he walks to his cupboard and pulls out a small statue. Laruku expresses his gratitude to Samadhi by putting his hands together and expressing his appreciation for the fact that he has been enjoying his time in the new world. After returning to his bed, Laruku experiences a glow that he does not realize he is experiencing. Suddenly, he begins to feel as though a glow has engulfed him while he was praying. He dismisses the sensation instantly and concludes that it is just his mind playing a joke on him with his imagination. Laruku resumes his daily routine and leaves the house the following morning. As he is leaving, he happens to run into Doldas. Doldas assumes that Laruku is going to the guild like the other people, and he inquires about his admission from Goldo's house. Laruku is surprised to find Doldas there. Doldas teases Goldo about his previous complaints about his house being too spacious for just him. Doldos proudly takes credit for the outcome of Goldo's house, including the fact that his team and father contributed significantly to the construction of the house. Laruku explains himself to Doldos and how he has been living with Goldo for a short while. Doldos's father, who is a carpenter, offered to help out in the construction of the house many years ago. After he spills additional facts about it, Goldo interrupts Doldos after picking out several unusual statements. Goldo grins mischievously as he learns about the person who was responsible for the construction of his unnecessarily large house. Goldo decides to pay back and announces his decision to summon Doldos's father to a drinking contest. Doldos finds himself feeling anxious and guilty as he recounts events that were supposed to be kept a secret. Doldos relates a narrative to Laruku about the dwarves being the only kind of creature to hold the record of finishing an entire bar loaded with booze without passing out and how Goldo shows otherwise by winning against one. When Goldo, Doldos, and Laruku enter a building, they hear weird whispering among the people they have met. Laruku makes an effort to comprehend the situation by asking some inquiries, but it appears that Goldo and Doldos are likewise in the dark about the scenario. A woman steps down the stairs, and Laruku knows her right away. Miss Lala asks for Laruku's attention because she has an urgent situation in which she requires his assistance. Laruku gratefully accepts her request, and Goldo arrives to accompany him. Lala pauses when they reach a wall regarding it as their destination. Goldo identifies the wall as fake and filled with magical energy. Lala explains how the existence of the door came about, courtesy of the guildmaster who built it out of laziness. Lala pleads with Laruku to assist her in rescuing the guildmaster from the wall and cleaning up a certain mess. During the time that Lala is cheering Guldo and Laruku on as they grudgingly clean up two rooms that are loaded with dirt, Lala has a sneaking suspicion that the guild leader is buried behind all of the clutter that appears in the area. Laruku tells Lala that cleaning the rooms did not provide any clues to the location of the guildmaster. However, Lala keeps a firm face and escorts them to the final room to check out. While they are there, she creates a protective barrier that she will use to protect Goldo and Laruku from falling items hitting him, but only on the condition that they remain within it. Lala heaves a sigh of relief as she discovers the books nicely arranged. Laruku observes the room and discovers only a touch and damage to the stack of books, and Laruku looks into a hole among the books and finds the guildmaster, Miss Fia. All of these individuals enter a room that is packed with books that are arranged in an odd manner. When Fia sees Guldo and Laruku, she recognizes them and asks why they are there. Lala tells Laruku to take some boxes apart so she can confront Fia. Fia starts to tremble as Lala comes to chastise her, angry that Fia made up her desire to read in order to find time to read in secret. While Lala is dealing with Fia, Goldo grabs Laruku by the shoulder and admonishes him not to offend Lala ever again. He then proceeds to tell Fia about a previous experience. A violent adventurer who frequently causes trouble at the guild years ago 
had a severe warning from Lala, but disregarded it. Eventually, he caused an issue with a girl who demanded his payment, even though he was at fault. When the adventurer defies Lala's orders, she lunges at him with fury. As a result of his disobedience, Lala eventually overcomes him and pummels him to the ground, forcing him to retire. When Laruku opens his delivery from the mailman, he discovers his school outfit, textbooks, and letters. Doldas stops him in his tracks by striking up a conversation. Surprisingly, Doldas gives Laruku gifts to celebrate his admission, and Laruku is assigned to deliver a speech. When Leah goes to see Laruku, her friend Sarah introduces herself and tells him that Leah has been talking about him a lot, which makes Leah feel ashamed. Laruku unintentionally stays up late to prepare his speech, leaving him with a pale complexion and bags under his eyes. After successfully delivering his speech and bowing, Laruku is dragged out of the room by Leah to go to the ceremony. Leah and Sarah congratulate him on his speech and inquire suspiciously as to Goldo's consent regarding his release from the capital. When Laruku gives his father's approval with an affirmation and a clause, Sarah seizes the chance and proposes that when Laruku gets settled at the academy, they go on a trip outside of the city. Laruku cautions the girls from loitering outside the capital's premises because he thinks there are monsters there. Leah reassures Laruku that she can defend herself and shares her magic stats with the group. After witnessing Sarah and Leah demonstrate their magical abilities, Laruku comments on how amazing they are and inquires about their advanced skills. Leah credits her high scores to the grace of the ruler who is watching over them. Sarah is under the protection of the ruler of water, while Leah is under the protection of the ruler of light. Carl greets his new class of students by telling them to formally introduce themselves to the class. Leon leads the introduction process and describes himself as a demi-human, while the other students follow suit. Carl enters the classroom and introduces himself to the students as the homeroom teacher, while Morris views himself as the assistant homeroom teacher. When a different student introduces himself as Roke Dursley, Laruku seems to recognize him right away. He notes that Roke is the son of one of the largest companies in the capital and acknowledges that he has learned from his classmates that there are a variety of people at the academy. Following the introduction, Morris and Carl lead the pupils outside to view the academy's facilities. Laruku observes Morris staring at him strangely and confronts him about it. While pretending at first, Morris subtly backstabs Laruku and asks about Goldo's well-being. Laruku offers to set up a means for Morris to get in touch with Goldo, but Morris declines right away. Morris then confides in Laruku about his feelings of guilt over leaving Goldo to face the dragon on his own years ago. Morris chooses to terminate the conversation when Laruku brings up his father's relationship with Doldos. Despite Laruku's assurances that Goldo wouldn't harbor such a grudge and his knowledge of Goldo's relationship with the adventurers and the advancements he has seen thus far. Throughout the course of the day, Rook questions Laruku about the abilities he will be revealing to the class, and Carl introduces the students to an ice healer while giving them instructions to each present a spell or talent they love. While Rook looks at Laruku in shock and praises him for his ability, Laruku joyfully explains the workings of his trick and how simple he thinks it to be. As other students watch them, they are amazed at their magical abilities. Laruku is asked a lot of questions concerning his storage abilities, to which he responds. Following class, Roek meets Laruku to find out about his plans for the rest of the day. When Laruku tells that he wants to look for something in the merchant area, Roek offers to help and even lead him because their paths intersect. Upon receiving pleasantries from the market vendors, Laruku chooses to make some purchases and expresses gratitude to Roek for going with him. When Laruku tells Roek that he is having trouble finding what he is looking for and that he would like to discover rice, Roek leads him right away to a business where he can inquire about the likelihood of getting rice. When Roek approaches the employee in charge, who appears to know Laruku as Goldo's son, he identifies her as Taldora, a longtime worker at his father's business. Laruku is told by Roek that the store carries a variety of uncommon goods, and he feels that rice should be among them. Taldora is taken aback that Laruku is aware that rice exists, even though Laruku won't admit that he once ate it before his rebirth. Taldora affirms that she is aware of rice and even keeps it on hand because no one has asked for it. When Taldora enters the store and exits with a crate of rice, Laruku yells in disbelief. His face lights up with delight and amazement at finding what he's been looking for for so long. He asks about the total amount of rice that is available and offers to buy them all. After asking Taldora to continue stocking rice as part of his goods, Laruku goes back home to create the rice and even write songs about it. 
When Goldo gets home, he declares Laruku a genius after tasting Laruku's creation. Laruku wakes up in his bed in a new environment after losing consciousness. Upon realizing he is with Samadhi, rather than praying to him, Samadhi flaps his alluring wings and apologizes for the spontaneous summons. Laruku believes he is dead, which is why he is seeing Samadhi again. But Samadhi tells him they are in the celestial realm and that Laruku's appearance is because he used all of his faith the day before. After confirming that Samadhi's words are accurate by looking at his skill stats, Laruku recalls their previous conversation when their faith reaches its maximum. As a reward, Laruku is given the title of Holy Man, but there are two requirements that must be met. After enumerating the requirements, Laruku enthusiastically asks about two strange beings he's been noticing. When the unusual entities fully disclose themselves to Laruku, they identify themselves as Gordra, the ruler of weapons, and Magalt, the ruler of magic. Maglit tells Laruku that she is interested in him and that Samadhi is to blame for his bad luck. Maglit receives input from Laruku regarding the efficacy of her talents in him, but he is unable to discern any information regarding Gordra's abilities. Gordra grumbles a little before telling Laruku to wait until his description materializes. Samadhi remarks that Gordra continues to show signs of shyness, but he quickly returns the conversation to the reason Laruku was called. He apologizes to Laruku for putting him in such an awkward situation, given his lack of experience, and says he will make up for the trouble over time. When Laruku checks his statistic skills again, he finds that they have improved to a god talent that contains miraculous light. Samadhi explains the nature of the abilities, saying that they allow Laruku to heal illnesses or injuries. Samadhi gives Laruku the skill, since he knows he would use it well. Laruku feels guilty about possessing such a skill, but he wonders whether Samadhi can use the power to heal a Goldo's wound. Laruku creates a method with the ideal justification for curing Goldo's wound. Laruku starts to distrust the scenario because the top healers in the nation are unable to treat Goldo's injury. So Samadhi gives him suggestions on how to approach Goldo and heal him. Samadhi also gets Laruku ready to return as it gets closer to morning in the real world. When Laruku comes to, he hears a loud thump and goes to investigate the problem at home. He finds Goldo untidy in the kitchen. And since he discovered Laruku unconscious in his room, Goldo cautiously welcomes Laruku and shares his thoughts. While Laruku offers to help Goldo with the food preparation, Goldo apologizes for getting ahead of himself. As Laruku cooks, he muses over his newfound power and how much attention he would likely garner if other people and nations find out. When Laruku decides to tell his father the truth, Goldo yells at him to get him to stop thinking. He then asks him to be careful and tries to have a conversation with him about his thoughts. Finally, Goldo sits down to listen to Laruku explain his abilities and lets him use them. When Goldo moves to the center of the room, Laruku unleashes the power and orders him to stay still so that he cannot question the safety of the experiment. When Goldo returns to reality, he sees that his injured legs have healed and his eyes have healed. Excitement sweeping through him, Goldo poses to talk about a more serious matter. Laruku goes back to bed, checks off tasks on his to-do list, and picks up his routine of reading the book about rice. Goldo and Laruku discuss the ramifications of his new powers and decide to keep it a secret from Al's and their associates until they need to use it. As Laruku hears a metallic sound while reading, he goes to investigate. There, he discovers that his father is attempting to alter his prosthetic leg to allay suspicions and has also decided to cover his eye with an eye patch. Laruku volunteers to help, but his father tells him to go to bed. Suddenly, Doldos shows over and asks for assistance right once, saying their inn is having problems. After Doldos's unexpected arrival very early in the morning, Goldo and Laruku dash to the small bear hostel, where the owner informs Laruku of their plight after finding that their food supply has been destroyed by rats. When Laruku goes to the store with the owner, he finds it to be disorganized. Everyone there offers to help get rid of the rats, but the owner says he needs more workers, so Laruku should go outside the capital to buy food. Laruku accepts the owner's offer without hesitation. Since he is skilled in storage, he decides to travel alone and asks about the quantity. However, Goldo spoils Laruku's plans by accompanying him in order to protect his son. Laruku tells Goldo that Mr. Datz, the storekeeper, will also travel with them but Goldo becomes irrational and insists on being overly protective. Laruku gets permission from Goldo to tour other stores after their purchase, but Goldo secretly follows him while pretending to finish his tasks. Laruku comes back to the Little Bear Lodge with extra food, and the explorers thank him for his assistance. 
Dats says he will give them a special dinner in appreciation for their work. While Doldos is being made fun of for his size because of his weight, Laruku listens in and hears some of the lodgers lamenting the damage the floor has caused to their clothing. In an attempt to address Dat's complaints, Laruku approaches him and offers to make a bath for everyone. When the bath is ready, everyone jumps for pleasure and loves it, and Goldo feels proud of himself since he sees how much everyone appreciates and thanks Laruku. When Laruku visits Amelda to update her on the status of the rat eradication effort, Anna jokingly requests that they continue their studies, to which Laruku agrees once more. After settling in fairly well at the academy and being granted special access as a top student, such as using the library's collection of books for individual use, Laruku talks briefly with Wallace about the advantages of reading at home after work, as opposed to reading on his commute. Laruku also has the option to skip lessons when it isn't essential, but he can only keep this privilege if he maintains a particular grade on his tests. After school, Laruku meets with Guldo to talk about their plans for the remainder of the day. Guldo begs Laruku to go with him to a place he won't say is named. Guldo enters a store, where the proprietor, Forno, greets him. Guldo shares his plans with Forno, but not before introducing him to Laruku. Forno thinks Laruku is short in stature and finds it hard to believe that Guldo is a father. Guldo tells Forno about the type of relationship he has with Laruku because they don't look alike. When Goldo asks Forno to measure Laruku's length, Forno learns that Laruku doesn't know why Goldo brought him and uses that to tease Goldo. Goldo then admits his plan for the surprise, which is to get Laruku some specially made armor and weapons once the time to leave the capital has arrived. Goldo rejects Forno's offer and insists on paying, which results in both of them acting petty. Forno tells Goldo the days it will take for it to be ready and decides to do it without receiving payment for it. As Goldo hears Laruku compliment their connection to Forno, he flushes. When the four days are almost over, Laruku rushes to Forno's store to get his orders, where he looks at each armor and weapon in amazement as Forno explains how to use them. Laruku changes into his full gear and notices every function that Forno had explained to him. Goldo continues to argue that Forno should receive compensation, but Laruku interrupts their petty arguments by calling out to each of them personally. Laruku stares out his window into the outside world, imagining what it might look like. His curiosity has increased even more since he acquired his gear. Lakuru slept and woke up with excitement, thinking about the adventure his father promised to take him on. He could not wait as he drifted back to sleep. The next morning, Lakuru got up early and prepared tea for his father, neatly dressed in his school uniform. He brought the tray of tea and cups to his father and reminded him of his promise to take him outside. After they had breakfast together, his father told him that it would be dangerous to go outside if he was not used to his equipment. Lakuru replied with enthusiasm that he would be fine. His father said that he could never be too careful and that the best thing to do was to have mock battles in the training room in the meantime. Lakuru agreed, and several days later, he was seen in a training session with his father. He held his short sword and swung it at a great speed at his father, who was taking it easy with him. Lakuru managed to hit his father, who shouted in pain and told him to take it easy and learn how to hold back a little as he coughed. Lakuru apologized and said that he thought it would be fine since his father was the one who talked about getting used to his equipment. His father, who wore an eye patch with a symbol of an animal skull on it, put his hand on his chin and observed Lakuru. He said that it looked like he had gotten used to his equipment. Lakuru said that they felt like another part of his body. His father told him that then he would not have any issues and that he guessed they could head out this weekend after school. Lakuru said yes with great excitement. He put on his school uniform, all neat, and walked to school with a bright grin. One of his friends, the half-human boy named Leon, crossed his path and saw how widely Lakuru smiled as he walked. They walked together in the school compound, and Leon commented that Lakuru looked happy and asked if something had happened. Lakuru asked with shock if his smile was that obvious. Leon said that it was kind of. Lakuru told Leon that tomorrow he would be going outside of the capital for the first time and that he was so excited about it. Leon replied with a little shock in his tone, asking if Lakuru was an adventurer and if he had never gone outside yet. As Leon asked these questions, he realized that they might offend Lakuru, so he apologized with a puppy face, saying that he was very sorry and that of course there were adventurers out there who had never been outside, trying to cheer up Lakuru. Leon mumbled as he teared up. But Lakuru still smiled brightly and calmly, telling Leon not to worry and that he was not upset. He said that his father was just overprotective. Leon asked Lakuru if his father was the hero known as Mr. Goldo, 
saying how surprising. He thought to himself that when it came to Lakuru, his father's concern reached unprecedented heights, but recently he had allowed Lakuru some freedom. They all finished school that day, being the last of the week, and Lakuru went back home, all excited and barely able to sleep due to his anticipation for the next day. The next morning, which was the weekend, he was the first to wake up, slamming the doors open, all excited because today was finally the day he could go outside the city. He had woken up earlier partly because he wanted to use the toilet. He yawned as he carried a lighted candle in his hand and headed for the toilet. After he was done, he used the opportunity to make preparations for their journey before going back to sleep. In a few hours, his father woke up, sitting at the table, just waking up. While Lakura was well-dressed and carrying a tray of food in his hand, he greeted his father good morning. He brought the food to his father and asked why he was still in his pajamas. He told him to hurry up and change, and then they would have breakfast. His father, who was still feeling sleepy, told him to wait a second. He said it was too early and the sun had not even come up yet. He yelled as he spoke and Lakuru yelled back. He said it was not too early and that time would fly by before they knew it if they were not prepared. He added, with his eyes shining with excitement, that he had done all the preparation. He said he had finished cleaning yesterday and he had already packed their lunches. He said he was ready to go at any time. His father saw how his radiance shone and could not resist his charm. He stretched his neck and thought to himself that he guessed it could not be helped. He saw that he had been looking forward to this for a long time. Lakuru said he was ready to go at any time, and as he said this, he held a lunch bag. His face turned red and bright. Soon after, the gate opened, and the guard asked Mr. Goldo if he had some business outside. He replied that he was going to look around the area with his son. The guard wished him a safe journey and saluted Lakuru's father. Lakuru bowed to greet the guard and then dashed forward, ready to explore the outside capital. As they walked outside the capital, Lakuru commented that the scenery was beautiful and that there were not a lot of monsters around where they were treading. He saw a big mountain from afar and asked his father what it was. His father replied that the people of the neighboring country of Rubrin called it Silver Dragon Mountain. He said that long ago, a legendary dragon known as the Silver Dragon made its home there and gave the mountain its name. Lakuru's father continued by saying that there were still people who believed that the Silver Dragon lived at the summit. He said that someday, Lakuru would go there and maybe even meet the Silver Dragon. As they walked in the bush, there was a flinch, and his father, who was very sensitive, sensed something. He stopped Lakuru, who had been looking around in the forest, in his motion. He put one of his fingers on his mouth to signal to Lakuru not to make a sound. He said very quietly that he sensed a prey. Then they looked over and saw a black monster known as a slime. Lakuru thought to himself that this was his first encounter with a monster since coming to this world. He was about to draw his sword from his sheath, ready to attack the monster. He and his father observed how the slime monsters were bouncing up and down. His father said it was a slime, and Lakuru recalled that slimes generally preferred wetlands or places filled with mana. He remembered that they were not aggressive and were usually carefree creatures, as he had learned from a book he had read earlier about monsters. Lakuru asked his father what they should do about the monster. He said it looked pretty harmless. His father replied that it might look like that, but it was still a full-fledged monster. He said that if it overpopulated, it could pollute the water supply with its mucus. He said that if it turned aggressive, it could attack human settlements along with other monsters. He said that besides, it was a good idea to hunt slimes since the materials from them could be useful. He said that it should not be too dangerous for Lakuru at his level. He asked if Lakuru would try fighting it. Lakuru was shocked and asked if he was sure. His father replied that they had come for that purpose of fighting monsters after all. Lakuru entered a fighting stance and drew his magic sword, but then he changed his mind. He decided to use his specialty magic instead, because he was afraid that if he attacked the slime at close range and got hurt, he would not be allowed to leave the capital for a second time. He conjured his specialty magic, an intense flame that melted the slime into a liquid. He collected the liquid in a tube, because he had to collect the material of the slime. He guessed that the slime turned into liquid because its core had broken from the intense flame. He faced his father excitedly, saying that he had defeated it. His father replied that he had watched the whole thing and gently patted his head, praising him for his good job. They continued at a steady pace, but no other monster appeared after that. They sat down for a while to eat their lunch and relax. As they went back, Lakuru's father noticed his son's expression and told him not to be depressed. He said that Lakuru might be eager to go on an adventure, 
but it was common to come back with nothing. Lakaru replied, yes, sir. They went back to the capital, and as they reached the gate, the guard at the gate saw Lakuru's dull expression and asked what was the matter. Lakuru walked in, his face all squeezed up, and his father told the guard that Lakuru was pouting because he did not encounter any monsters. The guard tried to encourage him as Lakuru walked away, saying that there was always a next time. When Lakuru reached his room and changed his clothes, he was disappointed that even though they had prepared so much, they did not see any strong monsters. He wanted to check his level to see if he had leveled up, but when he pulled it up, he noticed there was not much change. He said to himself that he guessed it was impossible from just one slime. Meanwhile, Lord Samadela's servant was seen shouting that what had happened was such a big mess, and also shouting at Lord Samadela that he should stop whining and do his job. He said that at this rate, Lakuru's soul would be destroyed. The servant was seen lamenting that of all things, why did Lakuru have to go and defeat a monster? He said that even though it was just one slime, all hell broke loose in the heavenly realm. Lakuru opened his eyes on his bed and saw his father on a chair. He was shocked to see his father in his room, but he felt surprisingly well-rested. He wondered why his father was in his room and jiggled him to wake him up. His father woke up with a huge shock on his face and gave his son a big hug, saying that he had finally woken up. He was so glad and got emotional, making Lakuru ask what was wrong. His father replied that Lakuru had been asleep for three days and that he was very worried. Lakuru was shocked at the mention of three days and said unconsciously that there was no way he would have slept for three days. His father said that he had no reason to lie to him and that he had even called a doctor, but the doctor diagnosed that nothing was wrong and that he did not know what to do. Lakuru then suggested that they check his status and they were very shocked to see that he had moved to level 38. His father asked if he was hurt somewhere and Lakuru replied no asking if the slime he defeated three days ago was a regular one. His father said that he thought so, and they were shocked that a single slime had moved Lakuru to level 38. Lakuru's father was so shocked and confused that he fell on his knees, making Lakuru ask if he was okay. His father asked if Lakuru could show him the material he got from defeating the slime, and Lakuru said yes, bringing forward the tube he had put the slime content in. His father took the tube and jiggled it, observing it carefully. He said that he saw how it was and that the slime Lakuru had defeated was not a normal one, but a stronger variant, a battle junkie slime. He said that if Lakuru looked closely, the blue core was darker than that of a regular slime and that it was a characteristic of the stronger variant. Lakuru looked in shock, thinking that he had never seen a regular slime core in the first place. His father continued, saying that the slime he defeated was a monster strong enough to give a hard time to even high-ranking adventurers and that it must have given Lakuru a lot of experience. Lakuru said he understood. His father still wondered if that was purely enough for Lakuru to level up so much, and Lakuru thought that it might be because he had an amplification skill of 10 times. He wondered if he should mention it to his father. His father asked if he could borrow the slime content for a bit, saying that he would get Master and Miss Lala to check it out. Lakuru said that it was no problem. Lakuru's father said that he would buy something on the way and asked if Lakuru wanted anything. Lakuru said that he need not worry and that he would cook for himself. His father told him that he had just recovered and that he should be careful and not overdo it. He told him to make sure he rested up as he left his room. Lakuru waved his father by and used a magic circle to pour himself water in a glass. As he drank, he said to himself that he missed the chance to tell him. He then remembered that if he prayed, he might be able to see Mr. Samadhi and maybe he would know something. He prayed and then Mr. Samadhi showed up bowing to the ground for Lakuru. Lakuru was embarrassed and said firstly that he should not prostrate himself and asked if he knew anything about the incident. Mr. Samadhi said yes and that he was very sorry. He said that he did not really expect him to defeat a battle junkie slime and that because of that, he had received a massive amount of experience, putting a burden on his soul. Lakuru was confused at the mention of burden. Mr. Samadil explained that Lakuru's soul could not keep up with his body growth when he leveled up all at once. He said that it was not a problem if the level increased slowly, but Lakuru had gained more than 30 levels in one go. Therefore, they had to adjust it so that it would increase gradually over three days. He said that if they had reacted a second later, Lakuru might have been bedridden for more than a month. He apologized for the trouble and Lakuru thought that he now understood why he kept sleeping. Lakuru told Mr. Samadil not to worry and that it was his fault. 
Mr. Samadil said that he did not expect that the ten times experience he gave to Lakuru with good intentions would turn out like this. Lakuru noticed that Mr. Samadil looked exhausted, and Mr. Samadil offered him a special skill as an apology. He said that he had prepared three options for him to choose from. The special skills were skill release, which allowed the max level of all skills to be increased by one, sacred library, which allowed the user to read any book that existed in the world, but only one book at a time and with a huge magic consumption, and divine familiar, which allowed the user to subjugate all monsters and divine beasts, but with consent required for assassination and common subordination magic, excluding divine beasts. Lakuru was shocked and asked if it was really okay for him to have one of the special skills because they were all extremely valuable. Mr. Samadil said yes, and Lakuru chose the divine familiar. Mr. Samadil asked why he chose that out of the three, and he explained that he did not think that the skill release was necessary because he did not know if he could level up the skills that high, and that he was worried about the enormous magic consumption of the sacred library, because it would be a waste if he did not have enough magic. Mr. Samadil granted him the special skill, and Lakuru thanked him for it. Mr. Samadil sent him back to his world as time flowed differently in the heavenly realm. When he woke up from his sleep, he saw that it was already late at night and everything was dark. He realized that the time that seemed like a few minutes in the heavenly realm was actually hours on earth. He heard his father say that he was coming into his room. He switched on the lamp by his bed and greeted his dad. His father entered and bowed his head, saying that he was sorry because he was pressured to sell the junkie material because it was valuable. Lakuru said that it was no problem and that he had also been thinking of selling it. His father said that the junkie slime was pretty high level and that was why his level skyrocketed. He also said that he found out that Lakuru kept sleeping because his level suddenly increased abruptly. Lakuru thought that his father seemed convinced and maybe he did not have to correct him. His father left and Lakuru saw a shooting star across the sky. He wondered if it was the legendary Silver Dragon.